Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Davies Adams, and I am the Director of Programs at the Pollinator Partnership, and it is my honor to welcome you to the 22nd Annual NAPSI Conference, the international body that is the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. Uh, today is actually day two, and this is our first ever attempt at a hybrid meeting. So I hope everyone has brought a lot of patience to the table. Uh, we'll see how all of this goes. We also have a public session happening today, so I wanna welcome any members of the public who are visiting. Uh, you will be here only for our opening and keynote speakers. And then our registered NAPSI members will continue throughout today and tomorrow. We have a very full agenda, uh, so please refer to the agenda that was sent via email and posted online at www.napsi.org. We're pleased to be able to accommodate both in person here at the beautiful museum uh, and also virtually this year, but there will be some logistical challenges. There will be some instructions that may not pertain to you. Again, just be patient and please stay present during our time together and only check your email and your phone during our breaks. Now, a couple of housekeeping items today. All of our keynote speakers are here in person, so we're very excited about that. And after each presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Those here in the auditorium who are here in person will be able to ask questions through microphones located at the front of the auditorium. For those of you who are attending virtually, uh, there is a Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question there and a conference moderator will read your question aloud during the Q&A portions. If for some reason your question is not answered due to time constraints, please email napsi at pollinator.org and we will be sure your question gets to the right person and gets answered. I'd also like to remind everyone uh, of the NAPSI ground rules for participation. They're posted again at napsi.org. And finally, you may also email napsi at pollinator.org if you are having technical difficulties and we'll do our best to help you. I also want to offer my personal welcome. It's going to be a great NAPSI, and throughout the 22-year history of NAPSI, there are two goals that have made NAPSI a unique proposition. First, our emphasis on bringing all stakeholders to the table, which means we don't always agree on everything, but we do seek the areas where we can agree and we make progress that is real and lasting. Um, we try not to build battlegrounds, especially that will divide, especially in this particular time in our country and in our continent when things are already volatile and emotionally charged. So we believe that perfectionism stands in the way of progress and that real change is strengthened through buy-in and engagement. And the second is that we foster strict adherence to the principles of good science, openness to multiple approaches, not taking selective slices of science to build campaigns, and building on real-world context in which we operate. In short, we believe in balance, in replicable studies, and in fair and complete facts. We want to recommend and support efforts that are cooperative and effective, pointing the way to a future that dials down the rhetoric and dials up the success. Other efforts have come and gone, but NAPSI and its parent and administrator pollinator partnership 
continue to see the power and lasting impact of building relationships that are founded on the whole truth. So I wanna thank you for being a part of this formidable and formative movement. I wanna thank you for your passion and your fairness. I wanna thank you for putting the work in both planning and executing change for the better. You are building conversations and collaborations that are extraordinarily powerful. Before I turn this over to our very capable executive director, Kelly Bills, uh, who's the executive director of both Pollinator Partnership and NAPSI, I wanna welcome Allison Wilcox to provide some welcoming remarks from our conference co-hosts. Allison Wilcox is the deputy director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History with responsibilities spanning collections, research, exhibitions, education, and operations. Ms. Wilcox has served in leadership roles at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and previously worked at the National Museum of Health and Medicine and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Please welcome Allison Wilcox. Good morning. Uh, I am Allison Wilcox. I'm the deputy director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and it is my pleasure to welcome our on-site and online audiences here today as you convened for the 2022 North American Pollinator Protection Campaign Conference. I understand this is our seventh time co-hosting this conference, and we are delighted to have you back. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Nacotchtank and contemporary Piscataway people and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, and future, who make their home here. I don't need to tell you how critically important the work of this body, a network of 170 diverse partners, is to ensuring a healthy and sustainable planet. We are honored to join you in this campaign. Our museum has long been a scientific leader in the discovery, description, identification, and understanding of pollinating animal species and the plants they visit in the present and across deep time. Our researchers join many of you in being the world's experts in the systematics, phylogenetics, genomics, ecology, and reproductive biology of flowering plants, bees, flies, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, birds, and bats. This, of course, is underpinned by the largest natural history collection in the world, a world-class collection of plants, insects, and vertebrates that help us understand species distribution, phenology, and the impact of environmental changes on pollinators and plants. We have continued to make great strides to make these collections available to researchers around the world, not only here on site, but also digitally. We've recently celebrated the digitization of all pressed plants in the U.S. National Herbarium, which are now available online. Um, and I know that we've completed our bumblebees and our carpenter bees, and we have uh, other pollinator insects. Uh, we have plans uh, for having those digitized as well. We also take very seriously our mission to help our visitors understand the natural world and their place in it through our educational programming and by experiencing our insect zoo, butterfly pavilion, and the pollinator garden outside the museum. Watching the joy that comes with handling live insects or being surrounded by butterflies is always inspiring, but it's even more rewarding witnessing the light bulb going on when they begin to put together the deeper importance of our interconnectedness with these incredible creatures and plants. Last year, NMNH launched Pollination DC, a community science urban ecology project that uses iNaturalist to document the insect pollinator species utilizing plants in community gardens throughout all eight wards of the District of Columbia. We've also distributed thousands of the NAPPC Pollinator Week posters to children and adults at various museum events and public programs. And on a personal note, I'd like to share that this summer, 
um, one of my neighbors had their yard sprayed for mosquitoes. It sparked a real conversation in my house, completely unprovoked by me, um, among my husband and both of my college-age kids about the effect of such practices on pollinators, bees in particular. And I mention this to let you know that your messages are getting through and that awareness and concern for these animals and their habitats is rising, and I think willingness to take action to protect them is rising as well. We look forward to continuing our partnership with NAPPC, and I must give a shout out to our own Gary Krepnik, who serves as the US Vice Chair of the NAPPC Steering Committee. Gary's enthusiasm is contagious, and we can't thank him enough for his commitment and his role in making our participation possible. On behalf of our entire museum community, we're delighted to partner with you in this important work. We're so pleased to have you here today and we wish you a successful conference. And finally, I will close by saying that bats are my favorite pollinators, but I'm open to persuasion. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, Allison, for your welcome remarks and for hosting us this week. And thank you to all the staff at the museum, from security to cafeteria to scientists, who have helped support our conference. We look forward to working together over the next two days at such a cherished and appropriate venue. I'd also like to thank each of you here today for devoting this time to work for a sustainable future for pollinators, people, and the planet. My name is Kelly Bills, formerly Kelly Rourke, the Executive Director of Pollinator Partnership and NAPSI. Pollinator Partnership is the group that protects all pollinators and brings all stakeholders to the table. Our mission is to promote the health of pollinators critical to food and ecosystems through conservation, education, and research. Pollinator Partnership is honored to have founded and coordinated the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign for 22 years. I would also like to thank our NAPSI Steering Committee members who are instrumental in the many successes of NAPSI. I don't have time to name everyone here, but you will meet some in person over the next two days, and others are joining us virtually. They are truly a remarkable group of people. As Lori mentioned, this is our first hybrid meeting, and I'm so grateful to the amazing Pollinator Partnership staff and NAPSI volunteers, including the steering committee, who have helped make this event possible. This is a very special year for Pollinator Partnership, our 25th anniversary. Looking back on the 10 years I've been with the organization, I cherish the partnerships and friendships we have forged over the years. So thank you for your partnership now, today, the next two days, and into the future. Pollinator Partnership has had a landmark 25th year. We have trained thousands of volunteers and pollinator stewards, enhanced over 150,000 acres of habitat, and provided free resources to an incalculable number of public and private stakeholders. An example of those resources are our new pollinator land management guides for farmers and ranchers. Through partnership with Walmart, we have created four guides for four regions of the United States with the goal of covering the entire country in the near term and all of North America eventually. Our Wings of Life poster depicting pollinating butterflies and moths and their mutualistically beneficial flowers depicted by artist Natalia Zahn captivated audiences during Pollinator Week, where with the help from partners at the Electric Power Research Institute, we reached over 2.7 million people. And lastly, before we head into our exciting keynote speaker session, I'd like to mention our NAPSI sponsors who contributed pollinated products in the conference materials you've received today in person and virtually. 
and provide critical support to keep NAPSI going year after year. You can see some of their logos on the poster, and we will have slides during the breaks that will showcase the diversity of this group. So thank you to our sponsors. And for one more bit of housekeeping, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that the restrooms are through the um, main entrance. To the right is the women's, to the left is the men's. And if you need Wi-Fi, the um, passwords are located at the back of the auditorium on either side. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Lori to introduce our first keynote presentation. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker presentation, Dr. Sammy Ramsey. Uh, Dr. Ramsey is executive director of the Ramsey Research Foundation, and he will be speaking about the pollinator pandemic, the overlooked role of parasites in honeybee health. Dr. Ramsey completed his PhD in entomology at the University of Maryland and his postdoctoral training at USDA ARS Bee Lab, and now serves as endowed professor of entomology at Colorado Boulder's uh, BioFrontiers Institute and the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Biology Department. His nonprofit, the Ramsey Research Foundation, works to remove barriers that slow the progress of and decrease access to science by developing novel pathways for scientific funding. Uh, now, for in-person participants, there are the microphones again at the front of the room where you can stand in line and ask questions after the presentation. And virtual participants, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation through the Q&A function. We only have a short time for these questions, so keep that in mind when you're framing your question, and we'll get to as many as possible. And now, Dr. Ramsey, it's all yours. Thank you so much, everyone. I am really excited to be here. This is gonna be a fun one. As I've got some data to present that has been multiple years in the making, um, tracking and uh, trying to better understand an organism that we have not dedicated, in my opinion, enough attention to. And so, let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, let's do a bit of obligatory background about honeybees. I'm sure that I don't need to introduce you to the organism, but I would love to kind of give you a bit more insight into the depths of how these colonies work. Honeybees are incredibly attractive organisms for another creature to live with. They are so attractive as uh, this, this group of organisms that there are many times more creatures that live inside of honeybee colonies or are associated with them than there are species of honeybees. We refer to these um, symbiotic organisms and these colony associates as mellitophiles, coming from the, the Greek words for honey and love, honey lovers. Now, these organisms are obsessed with honeybees because their colony structure is incredible. The fact that they are able to perfectly climate control this cavity that they live in makes it the perfect living space for any organism. Uh, I've been looking for a living space uh, now that I've just moved to Colorado, and so I'm evaluating constantly what landlords and other individuals offer. If the honeybees could be my landlord, let me tell you. The fact that the place is constantly perfectly climate controlled, um, the heat is always controlled, the humidity is always perfectly controlled, they constantly clean the place, round the clock cleaning service, there's a meal prep system, way better than Blue Apron, you've got Bee Apron, and then in addition to all of this, you have a round the clock security detail, willing to use lethal force to protect you, usually lethal against themselves, but still, willing to use lethal force to protect everything inside of that colony. So the question really isn't, why do they have so many creatures trying to get into the colony? It's why do they have so few that have made it? Honeybees have a number of defenses that allow them to exist in this remarkable colony structure that has so many resources that could benefit other creatures. And one of the most beneficial resources is the fat body contained in this brood, 
We think of honey as the most important thing. People typically think of bears as trying to break into colonies to get to honey, but it's actually the fat body in these bees that provides the bears plenty, plenty of protein and fat for the winter so that they can overwinter. It's really not the carbohydrate resource of the honey. And multiple creatures are after these organisms. Brood parasites are a very big portion of the molidophiles in honeybee colonies. Well, honeybees have a lot of defenses against these organisms, but when those defenses are overcome, it is very difficult for them to get the upper hand again. And because of the ways that we have changed the system by taking these honeybees out of their natural environment, putting them into a box and tending them in that context with a bunch of other bees in the same area, we've removed some of the natural protections that already exist and so we have to do something to make sure that these bees can be healthy in the artificial situation we've brought them into. So introducing Tropolelaps mercedesi, the next organism to haunt your dreams. This organism is a parasite of honeybees from Southeast Asia. It didn't have a common name uh, when I first started studying it, and I learned very quickly that people do not like to or cannot say Tropolelaps mercedesi. And so I've referred to this organism as tropi, or the tropi mite, and that's caught on a bit better. Uh, this is an emerging issue for Western apiculture as this organism has begun to spread around the world. Originally present only in Southeast Asia, so uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, the Malay Archipelago, Philippines, Malaysia, this region of the world was originally where they were present until they transitioned from the giant honeybees, which you can only find in Asia because they are not cavity nesters and thus can't climate control their environment. Uh, they transitioned to Apis mellifera, and that has allowed them to spread outside of Asia. So they're now present in the Middle East. A huge concern is that they are now present in Iran. And as they move towards the border of Turkey, this is where I get very nervous because this is the same pattern of spread that Varroa destructor went through uh, as it found its way into the Western world and into the rest of the world. But another big concern here is that we are doing the same thing that we did when Varroa was first becoming a problem. We looked at the nations where it was present, and we said, that's not our problem. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, thinking of a, 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 a transmissible illness as not our problem until it arrives on our doorstep is foolish and will never serve us. If we want to think of this from the most selfish perspective possible, Choosing to figure these creatures out while they are not yet in our geographic range benefits us because it protects us prophylactically. But if you want to think of this with a more global perspective and with more of a philanthropic perspective, helping people in these developing nations is immensely important. In Pakistan, when the tropolelaps mite arrived, it killed 100% of their honeybees all of them. They lost their entire population of honeybees in less than a decade to this parasitic mite. It feeds faster and more frequently than Varroa. It grows more quickly than Varroa, and its population size it grows more than twice as fast as Varroa destructors. So they overcome colonies very quickly. And Varroa destructor is the primary parasite impacting honeybee colonies around the world. So this parasite is of huge concern to me, uh, and I've been trying to kind of get a few more people on the we need to do something about tropy train, because we're already dealing with a pollinator pandemic in the Varroa destructor mite. We don't want a dual pandemic of Varroa destructor and tropolelaps. So considering that very little research has been conducted on this parasite, there are very few studies of this organism, its life cycle still has not been fully described, um, I decided that I wanted to do a dual-pronged project about this parasite. So I've spent some time in Thailand, part of its native range, and what you're seeing here is the very first video ever captured 
of the most important portion of this organism's life cycle, the period of time where it is under the cell capping and it is trapped inside of a cell with developing brood. We've never been able to get a video uh, of what these parasites do in this context because the normal system is for us to open the cell capping and look inside. That influx of air lets the parasite know the jig is up. Something's watching them and they stop doing all the normal behaviors that would normally uh, exist in this system. But by replacing one of the walls of the cell with high optical clarity glass, actually two of the walls of the cell, uh, with high optical clarity glass, I've been able to put um, these artificial cells into an incubator while they are still capped. Uh, this specially designed incubator that I've developed for this work uh, allows us to see through and kind of peer into the behaviors of these mites so that their life cycle can be fully described and we can learn about any weak links in their development. And I didn't want this project to just be something that provided us with information about how this organism works. I wanted us to also be able to exploit that information to get rid of them. Um, how we can treat these organisms and take them from being these very mobile, happy, excited um, parasites to these very dead, flipped over on their back parasites is much better. So I've been working on that as well. So we've separated the study. Uh, there's the Cite the Mite initiative for us to see what they're doing and the Fight the Mite initiative for us to kill them. Now, what we know about this parasite at this point is that we do not know enough. And so the Ramsey Research Foundation, working with Budapest University, uh, has been able to really get some insight into this parasite and allowed us to see for the first time what goes on inside of these cells. But another benefit is that it also allows us better resolution into what Varroa is doing. Um, varroa and tropolelaps sometimes co-occur in the same colonies. And so to be able to look at both of them and to get a better insight into how varroa feeding impacts honeybees, we know a lot of different issues that it causes, and seeing them actually feeding on fat body tissue allows us to better understand how all of these issues uh, kind of co-occur and create gigantic problems for the bees. But then also seeing the trophy mites just doing their business, walking around inside of these cells, interacting with the varroa mites gives us a better understanding of what we would be able to expect were they to invade honeybee colonies. The other huge concern that I have is that this parasite is the least species-specific honeybee parasite that we have ever encountered. Um, it is found in all of the different groups of honeybees, from the dwarf honeybees to the giant honeybees to the cavity nesting honeybees. But the biggest concern to me is that they are not exclusive to honeybees. In India, they've been found on carpenter bees. In Thailand, they've been found on bumblebees. And that is not cool. You understand what I'm saying? I need you to think for a moment about how a honeybee colony is structured with sometimes 60,000 individuals. You can spare a few that die. But if you are a carpenter bee and a parasite like this gets into your system where you are a single mother trying to tend to these offspring that you are taking care of, this organism feeding and uh, releasing viruses and causing problems can be lethal uh, to, the, to, to all that that parasite is and all that they are trying to accomplish. And so for this creature to get into our ecosystem would be deeply problematic. Uh, this is a... Uh, just a, a highlight of how the system works with the high optical clarity glass. This is the original one that uh, a, friend, uh, a friend of mine and I actually put together. Um, is a, a friend from church. I would go over to the machine shop in his garage and tinker with this stuff after church. And now that I'm working with the University of Colorado Boulder, I've got that sweet, sweet startup money, and we are building a, a much more uh, high-tech version of the Mite Insight system. But before, we cut open an old incubator, stuck this microscope with a camera on it on top, connected it to a relay recorder, and started filming the behaviors of these mites where we were able to actually witness the entirety of the life cycle because the relay recorder can run for 14 days uh, on end without us needing to switch to anything else. So that's been really fun. We've been tracking all the different behaviors and putting them into these massive pie charts so that we can see everything that they're doing from resting, walking, feeding, over position, aggression, dormancy, all of the different behaviors. But because I have limited time, I want to jump into the second half of the project, the fight the mite system, and then make sure that I save time for questions because I can't wait to answer them. So in this part of the project, now I 
I absolutely love conducting research, but getting to conduct research overseas is a wonderful privilege. Um, I've been conducting work in Thailand, and this has been on my own dime or on the dime of the Ramsey Research Foundation frequently because it is difficult to fund overseas research. And at the time where I was working with the USDA, um, there was kind of a, 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 a moratorium based on budget on, on some of these sorts of studies. And so we raised funding um, through crowdsourced initiatives. Uh, some of you in this room have actually helped with those crowdsourced initiatives and some of my own seed money into this process. Now that I'm with CU Boulder, they've actually established a research station for me in Thailand, and so I have somewhere to go now to continue this kind of work, and it must continue, because there isn't just the trophy mite, there's the Euvaroa mite and multiple other species uh, of, of brood parasites that can make or break a colony very rapidly. As we have been researching how to manage these parasites, uh, I've... Um, got a, a number of colonies that we have established in multiple locations uh, across Thailand. And then uh, we placed, uh, it was actually 20 colonies at this point, so 20 colonies at each location. The colonies, uh, colonies were strategically located to make sure that there was a food and water source. And then we tested different forms of treatment from Formic Pro. Uh, it, it, Formic, is, uh, Formic acid, it is a, a type of, of acid, organic acid that is naturally produced um, by hymenopterans, so by bees, ants, and wasps. And it's very effective for treating brood parasites, but the reason why I wanted to specifically target this one as opposed to so many of the other potential options, one, uh, trophy mites have shown resistance to multiple different forms of chemicals that are typically used against Varroa. They develop resistance very quickly. Uh, but the second reason is because uh, the mites spend very little time outside of the brood cell, uh, during the period of time that we typically treat varroa mites, it's during the time that they spend on the adult bees. Uh, between 3 and 13 days, they are outside of the cell not reproducing. Trophy mites have reduced that period of time to just a few hours, and so they are not able to get a full chemical exposure if you utilize something that only goes after the, the, the parasites when they are outside of the cells. This is one of the only chemicals present that can penetrate the cell capping, concentrate to large enough levels to actually attack the parasites while they're in their reproductive phase. And so this is the bees just, you know, hanging out after being treat it with formic. They don't like the stuff, so you can see when I open the colony, they are nowhere near those, those packets of um, uh, sawdust, basically compressed sawdust and formic acid, but they're, they're okay with it. But then I wanted to know how beekeepers in Southeast Asia have been managing this. When the beekeepers in Pakistan lost their colonies, they... Uh, Sent to they they sent word to other areas of uh, areas of Southeast Asia to ask them how have they been treating this parasite, and I wanted to know the same thing. And so I found um, after spending some time with Thai beekeepers and getting them to loosen up with me a bit um, that they actually utilize super concentrated formic acid themselves. But it's formic acid that's typically used in rubber plantations to solidify rubber. It is incredibly concentrated. If you do not use gloves, you will burn your skin. Uh, the vapors will burn all of your mucous membranes. You cannot be around this stuff without proper protective equipment. Um, they soak paint stirrers in this formic acid, this dangerous concentration of the substance, and push them into the front of the colonies. And I wanted to see how effective that would be as well. And so this is me working with that. This is one of the lower concentrations, and I want you to see just how the bees immediately respond to that. It's me and my entire gas mask, but check that out. Not a fan. Not a fan. They are falling all over top of themselves to get away from that stuff. But the bees that we are really trying to treat are not the adults. They're the bees that can't run away. They're the ones that are immobile inside of the comb where the parasites are feeding on them. And for the, 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 the next method of treatment, we actually had to prepare the colonies differently because uh, I wanted to also have a non-chemical treatment measure that could be used against these parasitic mites. Um, one, so that we would have multiple options, but two, something that will help us slow down on the pesticide treadmill that we have been on for so long. We have added so much chemical into the environment and we need other methods of controlling these organisms. So um, heat treatments were something that really intrigued me when I heard people talking about them. I've seen heat treatments be used very effectively in pest management for things like bed bugs and cockroaches. Can we use them against varroa mites? Well, the colonies are all sealed up 
because of the giant hornets that are constantly trying to get inside and eat everything. The entrances into the colonies are about the length of three bees and about the height of one bee. And so it's impossible to slide anything into the front entrance. So we drilled the colonies open and cut them open with uh, reciprocating saws. And, and yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> so then we were able to slide these heat treaters into the colony. They heat the colonies to 41 degrees Celsius or 106 degrees Fahrenheit for 160 minutes. Um, I, wanted, I also took samples of all of the bees so that we could look at the impact that this has on them over the course of their lives because while it does not have lethal impacts typically to the bees, what are the sublethal impacts to exposing developing bees to that much heat for more than two hours? And this is how the adult bees respond to these heating pads. Uh, the queen almost always leaves the colony during this process, and the bees just bundle around her on the front entrance, probably to maintain her sperm viability because heating up um, the stored sperm that she has could be problematic for it. And then the last of these treatments was to actually do a repeated heat treatment every 14 days using uh, a heating coil that's actually woven into the foundation of the frame such that instead of heating the entire colony, individual cells where the parasites are present are actually then heated. This is a really exciting uh, system because it uses a lot less energy and so we we're able to hook it up to a solar panel and instead of using electricity, just kind of get it going that way. And then we inspected um, 100 cells in a frame uh, randomly selected from each one of the 60 colonies that we worked with every single week. So I needed a lot of help, and that was a lot to do. Um, we looked at whether eggs were present, uh, whether mortality had occurred in the brood, and uh, this curious feature of bald brood where the bees are constantly uncapping cells almost at random when they know that there are parasites within the colony. And so when looking inside of these cells and looking at the parasites that are present, it's very useful uh, for us to be able to identify how many parasites are inside of each cell to see how effective different treatment measures were. And so this is a graphical representation, or sort of graphical, this is a figure representing uh, the work that we conducted the first time that we uh, did these these cell inspections. Any of the cells that you see that are represented by simply a white hexagon had no parasite present. The one shaped like a, a trophy mite, the elongated mite, of course, uh, had a trophy mite inside, and some had trophy and varroa in the same cells. And then you can see that the heat treatment uh, under some of these circumstances achieved 100% um, kill of the parasites under the cell capping, but this was very inconsistent. Our least consistent treatment was actually the heat treatment. If you look over here, uh, interestingly enough, the up and down that you're seeing with the heat treatment, every time we utilized heat treatment as a method, we got a, a very large, uh, we got a drop in the mite populations and then a spike the next week. And we don't quite understand exactly what happened here. We didn't see that with the usage of formic acid. Uh, the, so week zero is uh, the week before uh, we treated these colonies. And so those are the mite populations that you can see as our starting populations. Week one is the week, uh, the first week that we treated these colonies. And you can see very consistently that the mite populations remain low after treatment with either formic pro or uh, liquid formic. But the rest of the treatment options were a bit more variable. And you can see that specifically with tropi, the greatest impact on their populations was through usage of formic acid as the liquid formulation or uh, formic pro, the, the vaporized formulation there. And it's also interesting to look at the number of dead mites that we found uh, under the cell capping in these cells. So uh, week zero, uh, all of the red is the, the mites that were dead under the cell cappings when we opened them, the blue are live mites. And you can see um, with the heating pads, we still had a fair number of live mites still inside of the cells when we did the inspection in week one, which is on the, I guess, your left side of the screen. Um, but for formic acid, every time we opened a cell and we saw mites under the cell capping after treatment, those mites were very, very dead. Um, so actually tracking the population of dead mites inside of the colonies was really interesting to see. Um, and then week one was the week that they were treated every week after that. Um, so no further treatments were occurring. We wanted to see how long it took the mite populations to rebound. With the heating pads, they seemed to rebound immediately. 
um, but with formic acid and liquid formic, uh, very few mites were actually found live uh, under the cell capping. Zero for formic pro uh, and only a few with liquid formic. Um, there was much more work uh, conducted in this process, but um, there, there's only so much that I can tell you about in this limited time. So let me just say thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I would like to thank Project APIS-M for funding this work, Burapa University for uh, consistently uh, allowing me a place to continue this work in Thailand, as well as the United States Department of Agriculture for all of their support and help during this process. They have been absolutely wonderful. And if there are any questions, I would love to answer them. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Dr. Ramsey, for that incredible presentation. Uh, we have time for just a couple questions. We are just slightly behind here. Um, so uh, if anyone has any questions in the room, feel free to come up to the microphones at the front. And I don't see anyone here yet, so let's see if we have any questions from our online folks. I'll ask Amber Barnes from Pollinator Partnership to read one out if there is one. All right, yes, we do have a couple. Um, thanks, Kelly. So uh, as you mentioned, the trophy mite has been found on not just honeybees, but other solitary bees as well. Has there been any noted host species preference exhibited by the mite in these solitary bees? Thank you for that, that's a great question. Very little study has been conducted of these parasites, almost nothing has been conducted on their uh, interactions with non-honeybees. Um, I only know of one paper, and it is not particularly detailed, so no, uh, there is no data on that yet. But I'm looking for masters and PhD students as well as postdocs, so if you're interested, whoever asked that question, come to Boulder. <laughs> I is can this hear on? You. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is really great. So interesting. Thank I you. know that your answer to this is probably also going to be that there's been very little research done, but I'm wondering if you have any ideas about the interaction between varroa and trophy mites and in your observation of, the, of those kind of coexisting in a cell. Did you see anything like scary? <laughs> Thanks for asking that too, because that was a big question that I was wondering about. Um, the, the information currently present in the literature about trophy mites and varroa mites says that they will not go into the same cells and that they do not coexist for long in the same colonies. The trophy mites outcompete the varroa mites and the varroa mites disappear. I've found that to be the case in some areas of Asia, but not others. So in areas where it gets cooler for pretty much any period of time, both of those parasites exist in similar numbers inside of the colonies, and I'm really concerned that they can synergize into a worse parasite than the sum of their parts when they are together. When inside of the cells, they don't have the kinds of antagonistic interactions with each other that I thought they might have. They kind of, uh, you know, like drawing a line down the middle of the room and you're like, little brother has to stay on the other side. They sort of do that with the host where they typically don't feed at the same time. They partition their time uh, and they don't interact with each other aside from small bouts of sniffing and then they walk away. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, right? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, how are you? That was a great talk. I'm Laura Mirandin from Pollinator Partnership and Pollinator Partnership Canada. And I'm really curious to know, do we know anything about what is happening to the wild colonies in these locations of uh, honeybees? What is happening to the what colonies? The wild colonies of honeybees oh. in these locations. So the wild colonies of honeybees have been decimated by the trophy mites um, present in those locales. And so you will typically not find wild colonies of um, Apis mellifera bees. Now, of course, the giant honeybees, which have had millions of years of evolutionary history with these sorts of parasites, have their own defenses that are very effective uh, at controlling them. But Apis mellifera, because they kind of left Asia and developed as a parasite outside of the context, or developed as a honeybee outside of the context of parasites, they are lacking in the vast majority of parasite suppression genes. And as a result of that, every parasite is trying to switch over to them. They can only find managed colonies at this point in Southeast Asia, and so that's where they're going. 
And I'm sure I'm out of time, aren't I? Yep. <laughs> uh, do we have time for that one question? Oh, sure. Yeah. I didn't see the money. Sure. One more question. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Thank Edward you. Henry. I'm with NRCS. And my question for you relates to the control of both the Varroa as well as the trophy mites. How much overlap is there, and is the formic acid control that's be, that you showed to be so successful with the trophy mite just as successful in controlling Varroa? In other words, does one treatment cover both, or are they going to be independently a problem? Great question. Also something that I was very interested in knowing in this process, and that's the reason why um, in the numbers that you saw there, um, some of them are aggreg aggregative numbers, so it is all the brood parasites together, so Varroa, Uvaroa, uh, Tropolalaps, uh, all of them, um, and then uh, some of the, the charts, I actually separated them out into the different sets of parasites. There's another parasite called Uvaroa. You guys should Google it. It's really weird. Um, so the formic acid seemed to kill all of the brood parasites. Anything that got under the cell capping, um, when those chemicals, uh, when that chemical gets concentrated enough under the cell capping, it suppresses reproduction and kills the parasites. And so that's very effective to see because that same chemical can be used to suppress varroa, uvaroa, and trophy mites. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And if there are more questions, I'll be here all day. That was fantastic. That was a great way to start. Thank you. Uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about heat and its effect uh, on pollinators. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next presentation. And this is going to be from Dr. Bruce Stein. Uh, he's the chief scientist and associate vice president of the National Wildlife Federation. Dr. Stein is a biologist with expertise in biodiversity conservation and climate change. He has been a leader in the emerging field of climate adaptation and led development of the widely used climate smart conservation approach to adaptation planning. Dr. Stein will be speaking about pollinators and climate change, preparing for accelerating ecological transformations. Please welcome Dr. Bruce Stein. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here um, to speak at the conference and also to be here at the Smithsonian because, but for some career choices, I might have ended up in a place like this because my background actually was in systematic um, biology, specifically plant systematics, and so I have a lot of uh, close friends and colleagues here in the botany department of the Smithsonian. Um, I'm going to do a disclaimer right up front, which is that I am not a pollination specialist, um, but over the last 15 years, I've focused a lot on climate change, its effects on plants, animals, ecosystems, and most importantly, what we should be doing about that and doing differently in light of that. Um, but I will say that I do have some background in pollination biology and so have an understanding of the issues. Um, and in fact, uh, my PhD was on a group of plants, uh, mostly uh, South American Andean plants uh, in the Lobelia family. And, uh, some of them had a very interesting specialized pollinator relationship. Here you can see this um, sicklebill hummingbird, which is, has this, you know, amazingly decurved bill. And you can see the um, uh, centropogon flower on the left that, you know, it, it essentially fits, uh, you know, hand in glove into that flower. Um, it's, and, and I could talk for a long time about that system, but I will say, I, I wasn't sure what, uh, what Dr. Ramsey was going to be talking about, but I actually have my own trophy story related to this system, which is that uh, there is a different trophy mite, Tropicoceus, um, that actually lives on the nectar in these flowers. And um, in order to get from one flower to another, flowers are very ephemeral, right? So if you're going to live on the, in flowers, uh, you're not going to live very long because they go away. They hitch a ride in the nostrils of the hummingbirds that are pollinating them, and then they get a ride to another, uh, another set of flowers. And I had a colleague working on these, and 
I used to collect the mites when I saw them and sent them off, and at some point years later, I got a monograph in the mail uh, with a new species of Tropocosius named for me, Tropocosius steini. So that's my tropy story. Uh, uh, here's another species, actually, that was named after me, uh, an orchid from western uh, Ecuador um, that I collected because I had a close colleague, Cal Dodson, working on these. Uh, and just to point out, this is one of these unusual sexual deception pollination syndromes where this species, which is a telepogon, um, to a male tachinid fly looks enticingly like a female tachinid fly. So you can see that sort of purple, bristly area in the middle. Uh, but anyway, I, I didn't come here to sort of talk about tropical pollination and just things that, you know, bear my name. <laughs> uh, so I want to turn now to uh, a very specific example of where pollinators are being directly affected or indirectly affected by climate change. Um, this is an example of a Hawaiian honey creeper called an EEV. Um, it's, uh, and you can see that very decurved bill. You can see the flower there, which is actually a relative of those uh, centropogons that I showed you that it is a, in the genus Trematolobelia, one of the uh, Hawaiian lobelioids. And so, you know, again, that, that sort of hand in glove fit. I first visited Hawaii in the early 1980s and went up to an area called the Alakai Swamp on the island of Kauai. Uh, it's a very high elevation. It's, it's reputed to be one of the rainiest places on Earth. At that time, EEVs were pretty common, uh, and we saw and heard quite a number. They have a very distinctive call that's like a rusty door hinge. Um, and it was one of the few places you could still see Hawaiian honey creepers. Uh, I didn't get back to the Alakai until 2016 when I was in Hawaii for uh, the World Conservation Congress that year. And so I was really looking forward to going up there and revisiting this magical place. I spent an entire day slogging through the mud in the Alakai Swamp and heard not a single EEV. So we, what's happened? Well, one of the things that's happening in Hawaii, both to the EEV and other Hawaiian birds, is that there are non-native mosquitoes uh, that have been introduced that carry a, uh, various avian diseases, uh, avian malaria in particular, that is uh, lethal to many of these native Hawaiian birds. But the high elevation areas have remained cool and are inhospitable to, or were inhospitable to these non-native mosquitoes. As climate change has been uh, increasing the, the air temperature and, and essentially uh, allowing the mosquitoes to move upslope, essentially what you have is these formerly disease-free colder zones no longer serving as those kinds of refuges for these Hawaiian uh, birds. And so that's one of the things that's contributed to landing the EEV now on the federal endangered species list. So let's talk a little bit more generally about climate change. You know, when I started working on it uh, back in the early 2000s, we used to talk about climate change as something in the future, what will happen, what we think might happen. But uh, in fact, climate change is here, it's now, and it's happening at, at accelerating paces. Uh, each new study seems to show that we had been our, you know, deniers like to say that, oh, a lot of these are projections and projections and models are often wrong. And in one sense, they're absolutely right. Our projections have been wrong. The problem is they've been wrong in the wrong direction. Things have been getting worse faster than we projected. Um, there was a recent um, IPCC report. This is the international body that, that periodically issues um, definitive reports that uh, earlier this year that really uh, emphasized the need to ramp up both uh, reductions in emissions as well as our climate adaptation efforts. And it did a very nice job of identifying and synthesizing many of the impacts on biodiversity ecosystems and including pollinators and laying out some of the implications that pollinator declines due to climate change will have for both agricultural and natural systems. 
So I'm not going to get into going into detail on a lot of the specifics, but you know some of the key climatic changes. Um, rising temperature obviously is one of the main uh, main ones, and the past seven years have been the hottest in recorded history. Uh, there's obviously more variable precipitation, so both longer droughts and more severe droughts, as well as increases in heavy rainfall and flooding events, other forms of extreme weather events, hurricanes that are intensifying quicker, be becoming stronger. I mean, Hurricane Ian is an example of that. It intensified incredibly rapidly at the very end. Um, rising sea levels, and, and you know, sea levels have risen by about a foot over the past 100 years uh, here in the United States on average, but a recent uh, NOAA report projects that in the next 30 years, we'll see another flood. So that, think about that. If you buy a house now with a 30-year mortgage, on the coast, you can expect before you pay that mortgage off for sea level rise to be another foot higher. So from a species and ecosystem perspective, obviously these shifting climatic conditions have a huge impact because we know that species and ecosystems are very sensitive to, uh, to, to climatic factors of various types. Um, you can see on the right here, uh, you know, the plant hardiness zones, which a lot of gardeners use, and you can see how in the, at the top is the, uh, the plant hardiness zone that traditionally had been used and uh, the revised plant hardiness zone. So we're already beginning to, to see both the shift in these zones. We're already, there's many examples of shifts in species distributions often moving uh, north or poleward uh, or upslope. Oops. And of course, that means that there are a lot of different climate uh, impacts on plant pollinator interactions. Um, and, you know, just to summarize a couple of those things, you know, there are range shifts. So again, uh, either the plant or the pollinator might, might be um, moving, uh, shifting its range um, in one direction, often, again, northward or, or upslope. We might see changes in population numbers or viability. So, you, you know, depending on, uh, as you get more extreme temperature, you might exceed the physiological tolerances of, of particular species, especially insect uh, species. There's alteration of habitat due to climatic factors, which uh, uh, clearly has a, a big disrupting factor for many pollinators. And then there's evolutionary pressures that seem to be actually exerting selective pressure on morphology and behavior. And a lot of this then uh, also gets to the disruption of these interspecific interactions. Um, so you might have spatial mismatches. That is, think about, you know, if a, if a uh, pollinator is specialized to visiting a particular flower and the flower comes out either before or after the pollinator is there, that's kind of a problem. So, you know, that's an example of a temporal or a phenological mismatch. Um, and then obviously reduction in the nectar and pollen resources available to pollinators it can be another major problem. So let's look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, the Kino checkerspot butterfly in California was one of the early examples of climate-related responses. Uh, uh, back in the early 2000s, Camille Parmesan, you know, has been really one of the pioneers in documenting the impacts of climate change on biodiversity generally. And, she did a lot of work related to the Kino um, checkerspot butterfly, which is a federally listed species. And it's interesting because the butterfly has actually responded to these changing conditions. So it has, um, there, there have been some latitudinal and elevational shifts that have been observed. And it, there's even a shift in host plants uh, from uh, plantain or plantago to colinsia, which is, uh, I think, in the monkey flower family. Um, but they also looked at sort of where future climatically suitable habitat would exist, and it's really far outside of the current range. So you can see the current range sort of in the blue and the, climatic, the, the projected future range in orange. Well, that's a, that's a big dis difference. I mean, for those of you who know California, I mean, Los Angeles is kind of between those <laughs> things. I mean, that's, that's up in the Big Sur area and Bay Area. Uh, we're in the future. So the near-term persistence has been aided by some innate adaptive responses in the species, but longer-term 
it will likely require some more dramatic interventions, including you know, possibly picking these things up and relocating them, something that's both controversial and, and known as, uh, quote unquote, assisted migration, or a probably better uh, managed translocation. Carner blue butterfly is another example, and uh, this is actually one where we've actually seen climate-driven extirpation uh, at the population level. So Indiana Dunes National Park is at the southernmost um, uh, portion of the Carner Blue Range. Um, Carner Blue, by the way, is another federally listed um, endangered species. Um, and what they found looking, studying that population is that in, uh, in 2012, well, it had been declining for some time, but in 2012, there was an unusually early spring and there was also a pretty severe drought. So in, uh, in the spring of 2012, the first batch of caterpillars hatched before their host plant, which are lupins, was available. That's kind of bad news. That's that phenological mismatch, right? The second brood hatched after the lupins had already died due to that uh, very dry summer. So that's an example of the danger of living on the trailing edge of your range, right? Um, bumblebees are kind of a different uh, case study because they are feeling what we're calling the climatic squeeze. So as I mentioned, a lot of species are shifting poleward or upslope to track warming conditions. Um, but uh, there's been research that has found that bumblebees don't appear to be doing so. So the result is that the southern range is contracting, but you don't have a corresponding expansion of the northern range. So they're kind of being caught in this climate vice, if you will. Um, and you know, there's been some additional research looking at sort of what some of the uh, reasons for the declines and particularly uh, unusually hot days seem to be uh, implicated. So kind of wrong time, wrong place, this notion of phenological and temporal mismatches is really an important concept here. This shift in timing of biological phenomena. So earlier spring, later winter onset, et cetera. But, you know, different organisms will respond differently, right? Plants, uh, different species of insects will respond differently. Different, you know, plants will respond differently to their pollinators. Uh, some species use temperature as cues. Others use photoperiod. So that, that is where you start to get into some of these problems. And, um, uh, there's been really interesting work by Richard Premack and his colleagues in Boston where they actually found that, that Henry David Thoreau, the famous naturalist, kept super detailed and meticulous records of, of bloom times and leaf out, you know, back before phenology had a name. He was keeping phenological records. They've been able to uh, look at the um, current uh, current leaf out, bloom periods in the, the areas that he worked and, and document how these things are shifting. And one of the things, I've found a lot of stuff, but you know, for instance, the leaf out is coming, coming earlier than it used to be. And for those that know about East Coast spring ephemeral wildflowers, they require that period when it's warm enough to, to um, bloom but before the leaves are um, shading out the sunlight. And so here's an example where these spring ephemerals, which are so important for pollinators, are starting to get squeezed themselves. Now there's also climatic impacts on the floral resources. So increasing drought, you know, uh, can really uh, harm those floral resources. And, you know, we're, we've been seeing um, hotter and longer droughts um, uh, the Southwest is experiencing the most severe drought in 1,200 years. Uh, in particular, Texas, you know, is a bottleneck for migrating, certain um, migrating species, including monarchs. And so, you know, um, the drought and, and its effect on floral resources can be a big problem in that pinch point. And then uh, invasive species are also responding to changing climatic conditions and warming conditions. And, and, uh, you know, that's not the only reason why they're expanding, but uh, obviously th this, these climate-driven expansions of invasives are really having an effect on displacing vegetation and, and uh, degrading floral resources for pollinators. So 
what do we do about that? I mean, there's a couple of major responses to climate change. Climate mitigation is what you often hear about, you know, which addresses the cause, uh, and the focus is on reducing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. Climate adaptation, which is what I focus on, is about addressing the impacts of climate change on people and nature, and on how to prepare for and manage for these changes. Um, it can perhaps most simply be described, as IPCC has done, as the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects, um, and it's mostly focused on reducing climate-related vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, one of the things that I've spent time on uh, over the last uh, 15 years is really trying to understand what does this mean in practice? How do we actually take the principles? Uh, how do we, what are the principles for climate adaptation or what we call climate smart conservation and how do we operationalize them? And in 2014, I worked with uh, an interagency group to develop this guide on climate smart conservation that's since been tailored for uh, the US National Park Service. I helped write uh, uh, an adaptation guide for that agency and, and you can see in the bottom right a similar adaptation guide that I uh, developed for the U.S. Department of Defense. We identified four key principles for effective adaptation. The first is to act with intentionality, and by that I mean link your actions to specific climate impacts. Don't just invoke the word resilience, which is so, um, uh, so common these days, but actually do the homework and ask, what are the climate impacts, how is it affecting the species or the resources we work we are interested in and how do we link our actions to reducing the uh, vulnerabilities of those resources. But we need to also consider that we need, increasingly will need to manage for change, not just persistence. That is, as conservationists, we mostly focus, have focused over the last century in either trying to keep things as they are or go back to some uh, previous uh, desired condition. Things are changing, we're going to be uh, needing to manage for that change, understanding when we can resist, when we're going to have to accommodate, and when we're going to need to direct those changes. We also need to reconsider our conservation goals and not just tweak our strategies. Both have a place and integrate adaptation into all of our existing work. It's not something that you outsource, someone else does. We've developed a planning cycle, which I won't go into, that looks a lot like con many conservation planning cycles, but. Uh, emphasizes assessing those climatic vulnerabilities and risks and, and rethinking your goals. And I, I wanted to just spend a little time on that concept of vulnerability because it, uh, it's kind of core to, you know, how we address this. So vulnerability typically is thought to have three components. Your sensitivity to a change, and in this instance, this guy's sensitivity to ragweed. Um, your exposure to that change. You can be sensitive, but if you live someplace where there's no ragweed, then you're not really vulnerable. But if you're exposed to it, that's, and then what's called your adaptive capacity, the, uh, the ability to cope with or accommodate to that change. And that adaptive capacity component is something that's been hard to uh, understand. Um, and so myself and a number of colleagues de recently developed a new framework for evaluating the uh, climate adaptive capacity of species, both plants and animals, based on, you know, looking at what the attributes of species are, ranging from, uh, you know, these demography distribution, do you have the ability to move or not? don't have the ability to move. It also includes your codependency, so in a lot of plant pollinator relationships. Are you highly specialized or are you, you know, able to really sort of shift host preferences uh, because if you're really super specialized, well, you're likely to be, you'll have less adaptive capacity, be more vulnerable. And it can uh, inform what our adaptation options are. And, you know, we, we actually, I should say, we, we summarize this as kind of this notion of persist in place versus shift in space, because those are two of the major uh, adaptive responses that we see in species, right? Um, and we looked at a couple of pollinator species because we wanted this to uh, be able to apply broadly, insects, vertebrates, plants, sessile organisms, mobile organisms. Here's that Carner blue butterfly again, which on the left you can see the adaptive capacity wheel and all those red spokes 
show you know, the attributes where a, a Karner blue is, uh, has very low adaptive capacity or high vulnerability. Um, uh, the alpine bumblebee, a European species, is an example of one where much higher adaptive capacity overall, but in this instance, we actually found that uh, prolonged hot spells kind of was a deal breaker. That is, even though it had generally high adaptive capacity, if it experienced prolonged hot spells, then that was going to override uh, a lot of that. So just to sum up, uh, there are some things that we should be thinking about in terms of managing pollinators uh, and pollinator populations with climate in mind. We need to understand the vulnerabilities of both the plants, the plant hosts, and the plant nectar resources, as well as the pollinator. Um, we need to seek opportunities to maintain floral resources across the seasons, and we often refer to this as climate smart planting palettes. So increasingly favoring drought resistance and diverse and sequential blooming. And we also need to consider broadening the source material because you know, we often as ecologists want to use locally adapted gene types uh, for our restoration efforts. But in light of climate change, we're going to need to rethink that and probably begin broadening uh, those, um, uh, those seed sources and genotypes. And we need to think about enhancing options for species movement, gene flow, and range shifts. And just as an example, finally, uh, of how this starts to look, um, my colleague Rebecca Quinones with National Wildlife Federation has been working in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, which is an important uh, area critical for a lot of subtropical tropical butterflies and bird species, as well as uh, you know, path, uh, part of the migratory pathway for, for species like monarchs. And what, uh, what she and her colleagues have been doing has been installing climate resilient native nectar and host plants in vacant lots and roadsides, because this is a highly urbanized area, very fragmented area. So this is a way to sort of provide these stepping stones and, and uh, using a diverse mix of native plants that are both capable of thriving in current conditions as well as under future climatic conditions and that again offer that variety of nectar sources throughout the entire year. So with that, I thank you and see if we've got any time for questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Stein. That was a wonderful presentation. We have time for probably two questions. If anyone in the room has one, please come up to the microphone. And um, if not, we'll see if we have any from someone online. No questions online so far. Oh, we have one in, in the room here. Let's see, uh, Vicki, go ahead first. Hi, thank you, Dr. Sign. I just wanted to appreciate your bringing up our Hawaiian dilemma and um, the EEV is just one of many birds that are suffering and um, a lot of our energy in the Fish and Wildlife Service is going into the concept of conservation introductions, assisted migration, as you uh, were mentioning. We do have birds that may only survive if we move them from one island to the other. And I just wanted to thank you for bringing that up. I think this is something the conservation community has to grapple with. With We also have to um, bring the public along um, in ways that I don't think we fully have understood how to do that. And we're working a lot with the Native Hawaiian community to understand how they feel about this. But um, yeah, you, you just hit it spot on. So thank you. I, just really not a question. It's just an appreciation. Well, for well uh, thank you. But that. let me also just say uh, your point about doing things that may make us uncomfortable. Um, we are going to see more of that. And, and again, the notion that we are going to be able to just turn the clock back and go to the way it used to be is, is just not really um, reasonable. Um, and so then the question is, you know, what are the things that we can do that will have positive outcomes? How do we assess the risks of those? Guard against maladaptation. Uh, but, but it is going to be very challenging. And Hawaii is at the heart of this. I mean, how to deal with these invasive, uh, you know, the, the, um, 
the mosquitoes, and, and you know, people are talking about genetic modification approaches, which uh, typically, uh, you know, there's some very, you know, strong responses to that, but we're going to have to put everything on the table to, to really get ahead of some of these Thanks problems. Thanks again for illustrating it. Appreciate yeah. it. Yes. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, my name is Casey Tompkins. I'm an ecologist with a utility group in uh, southeastern New York, and we practice native restoration on all of our projects um, and even engage in new projects as well at our facilities. And one of the questions that I have is around your remark uh, for climate resilient plants. Obviously, one of the important factors here is diversity and abundance of plants, but I don't think I've ever seen a very specific list, at least for the Northeast, on climate resilient plants. I'm not sure if you or anyone else in this crowd is aware, but is anything like that available for a company looking to practice that? So, so did, did I hear you to ask if there are any specific lists of climate resilient plants? Is that? That is correct. Correct. Um, you know, there are some people that have begun working on that. I don't know that I've seen um, sort of a, a specific list, uh, because again, it's, it also is very place-based, obviously. So if you're in New York, it would look very different than, uh, than it would be in, in the Southeast. Um, but I, I, would, I would say that that is a really important need, um, uh, particularly in the context of ecological restoration. And, you know, I, I, I would just also distinguish, you know, there are the kinds of climate resilient plants that we might put in gardens to help pollinators, uh, but we may be caref want, want to be careful about uh, which plants we use in sort of a garden setting and which plants we actually use in an ecological restoration setting. My own organization, National Wildlife Federation, has what we call our Garden for Wildlife program, where we actually have identified sets of uh, plants that we actually do think are native species that are appropriate for particular ecoregions and states. Um, but we're very clear that these are intended for use in gardens, not, you know, the same species might be appropriate for ecological restoration, but that's not the intended purpose of this particular program, so. Yeah. Right, well, thank you, I appreciate it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, that's all the time. Thank you. And before we introduce our next speaker, I wanna just let you know, we again are running a little bit behind. We're gonna have one more speaker and then we'll go into a break. So here's Lori to introduce our next one. Well, thank you. Um, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Kevin Butt. Kevin Butt is the Director of uh, Environmental Sustainability for Toyota's North American Environmental Sustainability Programs. He's responsible for the development of environmental sustainability, and related regulatory and legislative development for all of Toyota's North American operations. Mr. Butt serves on several environmental boards, including the Pollinator Partnership, and we'll now hear Kevin Butt's presentation about how corporations can support pollinators while meeting sustainability goals. Please welcome Kevin. Well, what a pleasure it is to be here. Um, beautiful time of the year here in the nation's capital. And what a pleasure to be on the board of Pollinator Partnership. What a great organization in moving us forward and where we need to be. One of the things that uh, I would like to point out, I too started my career in the academic world. Then I wrote my final paper. It was called The Effects of Non-Precipitating chemicals, I'm sorry, the effects of acid rain precursors on non-precipitating orographic cloud formations. And that's when I said, yeah, not doing that again. Um, and that's not something my kids would want to read. So I went to the dark side. And what I found is that those of us in the, in the manufacturing side of the business, we also have a desire to try to make improvements. And we at Toyota, we believe in climate change. We believe we're part of the problem. And therefore we have the responsibility and obligation 
to make change. And we're in a journey trying to make that happen. I appreciate the fact that almost every cab I see in this city is a Camry hybrid or a Corolla hybrid. That's great for my retirement, but it's also good for the environment as we begin the electrification process of our vehicles. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a little bit about our journey, and I won't go over this eye chart for you. But in, globally, Toyota has what we call our Environmental Challenge 2050. And I am gonna, can I use this mic? I'm a Roman. <laughs> and now? This is a radio face. They don't need to see it. <laughs> okay. All, they, all right. I'll quit. All right. So this is the Toyota's image right here. This, this is a part of the global effort where we have several targets, six targets all, to, all together. And a lot of the big ones that everybody likes to talk about is carbon, right? When we talk about carbon, talk about electrification. And I'm not going to get on a debate about electrification, the speed of electrification and all the... Um, impacts of moving to electrification very fast and before we even really think about the consequences. But what I am going to talk about is our challenge six and that is about biodiversity and what we're trying to do in that space. And by the way, challenge, I want, we, I'd love to talk about water at some point in time. Water is one of my biggest concerns and I pushed the wrong button. So, in North America, we have started a process of, and I often get this question, why is an automobile company worried about biodiversity? Well, that's a part of our responsibility. We build manufacturing operations. We have impacts there. We have the responsibility to understand what those impacts are to those areas. And so one of the things we're doing, you can see this lovely picture on the, on the top left here, is of our corporate headquarters in Dallas, Texas, which by the way, holds over 5,000 people, which currently only has 200 people in it on a daily basis um, due to COVID. But the good thing is we built that facility out of respect for the, the community and the grounds that were there. We put all uh, the right species in, water tolerant, and native species to that facility. And we only have a very small portion of the grounds that we actually mow. The bottom picture there with the bison, it's another great project. I just came back from South Dakota where we just reintroduced another 150 head of bison into the Northern Great Plains in the Wallacota Indian Nation. And why is that so important? Well, one, it's great for that, that tribe to become more economic independent, but it's what the bison does for the Northern Great Plain and the prairie. And how does that have an impact on improving the ability of that prairie to survive and have native species plants come back as opposed to grazing of cattle. And it also has a carbon sink effect as that improvement takes place in the Northern Great Plains. And there's nothing, well, I can't say that. The Northern Great Plains, when it's back to its natural state, is an incredible ecosystem something that we need to preserve, and the impacts it has on pollinators is incredible. So we're very proud to be a part of that and a partner in that with the World Wildlife Fund. The others are just some great pictures, actually some of them that I took, so I'm, I'm a budding photographer. Uh, but these are all pictures of uh, what goes on on some of our property. Toyota also has 17 sites across North America that have planted pollinator gardens uh, along this migration path. Uh, this is something that our team members get involved in. It's a very popular program that we have. And in that, uh, I won't read all this to you, but our Toyota Motor Manufacturing Texas has a program there uh, of 76.4 .76 acres of grassland managed to support native wildlife. Uh, and 0.7 acre landscape pollinated garden to an effort to ex uh, exclude the fer invasive feral hog. And those hogs get really big down there and they can destroy a lot of property. But more importantly, it's about education. How do we educate our team members and our community about what we're trying to do so that they can learn from that and take that home and begin 
because nothing happens if we don't do it at scale. Every little bit helps, but how do we scale this change across uh, our team members, and their homes, and our communities? That's the important part of this, and how do we get there? I just wanted to show off that picture. <laughs> but what this will give me a little bit of time to talk about is the great partnership that we have with the Apollo Partnership. We partnered with them on a $200,000 a year project where we're actually trying to uh, develop 15,000 acres of new pollinator habitat. We're excited about that. We're excited to work with these great folks, and we're moving in that direction. I think we've almost got the first 15,000, right? So that's something that we will continue to do. That's a part of the process of, of continuing to make change and trying to make change at scale. This is a uh, highlight of uh, our engine plant in Buffalo, West Virginia. Uh, part of the education process where we put out all on the trails that we make on property, uh, signage that helps educate people. And these trails are also open to the public so that they can learn uh, from that as well. Typical sign on one of our uh, trails. What I wanna talk about now, don't get confused by the date that's at the bottom of this, of the webinar for October 5th, 2022. This is just an example. I, also, I serve as chairman of the Supplier Partnership for the Environment, which is a group of all the original equipment manufacturers for automobiles, plus all of our suppliers. When I talk about doing and making change at scale, we have to begin incorporating large sectors of industry to be able to work together because we have a lot of pull in the areas in which we do business and the properties in which we own and also off property. So what we've done in this pollinator project, and I'm so excited about this, uh, we have this vision where we can demonstrate this leadership across the automobile industry of working together with our suppliers and developing new and better uh, lands of pollinator gardens, but also education of their team members and their team members can tell their families. And how do we begin just spreading this word? We have a challenge in the, in the SP uh, pollinator challenge. Um, we have over 200 now pollinator projects, over 2,500 acres of habitat, and 100 plus projects that have been certified by the Wildlife Habitat Council as certified sites. That number continues to grow and what I'm talking about here is that education through scale and the ability to make change. We may be on the dark side, we may be that manufacturing side of the business, but we are helping and continuing to, to show some light. I don't like to think that we're always the dark side, right? We have impacts, we have to address those impacts and we're continuing to make things better. What I'd like to leave you with today is a cute little girl picture. We've, we, we need to continue to listen to the great science that comes out of the academic world, the practical application that comes out from the beekeepers and the bee farmers to the people that are planting pollinator gardens. And we also need to do this because I don't think that we're gonna be regulated in time to make it happen. We need to do this before we're regulated. Everybody needs to work together. We all know what happens. It's hard for me to say here in this city that I'm in, but when we get regulated, sometimes not all good things happen. That's personal conjecture, but it happens. Let's get together, let's work as industry, as a pollinator partnership, and anybody else that we can to educate people on the need for change and the speed that we need to make change. I had the great fortune of spending two hours with Dr. Jane Goodall one-on-one -on -one, um, about four months ago. Probably one of the most humble experiences I've ever had. What an incredible individual. I hope that when I'm 88 years old, I'm still upright let alone having the influence that someone like Dr. Jane Goodall has and continuing to go around the world teaching people and educating people 
on what she believes in. That's the spirit that we need. That's the spirit that we need to continue to preach. And my father was a United Methodist minister, so that's where soon we'll have to take an offering here. But, um, but that's what I'm going to leave you with. Let's continue the effort. Let's continue to work together, and let's make change quickly. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that wonderful presentation. And I just have to say that the project we're working on with them, it's 26,000 acres of habitat in five years. And it's remarkable. And I really enjoy working on it. So very good. Um, so we'll see if we have any questions from anyone in the audience uh, here in person or online. I don't see anyone moving. So I think we will head to break. Thank you again, Kevin. And I'll just give a little bit of instruction here before we do break. Um, so for those people in person today, we are going to be going to lunch. For those virtual, you'll be having a nice break. Um, everyone here in person should have received a meal ticket, which is uh, enough to cover $20 at the cafeteria plus tax. Um, there are two floors of the cafeteria, and we will lead you out the uh, auditorium through the main hall where registration was and to the left. Um, you may get food on either floor of the auditorium, but we will have a spot reserved for us um, on the main level in the back, and we'll show you where that is. And um, for everyone else, we will start back up at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll see you after the break for some more keynote speakers. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for your patience while we ironed out those last-minute uh, tech issues. Um, so hope you had a nice lunch. I'm just still reeling from the wonderful presentations we had this morning and looking forward to three more keynote speakers. Um, so at this time, I will ask for Vicki Finn from the steering committee to come up and introduce our next set of speakers. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vicki Finn. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I serve as our conservation coordinator. I'm in our science applications program, and I am based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm also the liaison to NAPSI. And so it's a pleasure to be here. So today, I would like to introduce Dr. Matt O'Neill. Matt is a professor of entomology at Iowa State University, where he oversees research on the management of insect pests on, of annual crops and the conservation of beneficial insects, especially pollinators. He is a member of the STRIPS project which has led to the creation of the Prairie Strip Practice administered by USDA's Conservation Reserve Program. I'll now invite Matt to come on, um, on stage. His presentation is called Conserving Pollinators in Farmland, Lessons from the Strips Project. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you to uh, Kelly Bills and Reed Leavers and all of NAPSI for the invitation to come and speak to you uh, today. Appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the work we've been doing in Iowa, or what maybe some of you call flyover, um, in an effort to uh, increase our footprint for conservation. So um, I'm just narcissistic enough to want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, so uh, beyond the introduction, I should point out that uh, well, we have two types of entomologists in Iowa. We have the corn entomologist and the soybean entomologist. I'm the soybean entomologist. And I was hired uh, in, 20, in 2004 to deal with this beast. This is an invasive insect, uh, the soybean aphid. It fundamentally changed how we grow soybeans, not just in Iowa, but in the bulk of the region where soybeans are grown in part because we went from using very few, uh, very little insecticides to using both 
foliar applied and seed applied insecticides. And along the way, as we're trying to learn how best to use these tools, we learned that within the soybean fields, there is this community of beneficial insects, including lady beetles like this, a natural enemy of the aphid. And along the way, my team started noticing, as well as many others who were spending many hours in soybean fields, uh, there were these. Uh, this is a honeybee, but there, along the way, we found easily over 50 plus species of bees and other pollinators in soybean fields. So that's sort of my origin story for how I came to be here today. Um, but I want to talk about a, a project that has involved many of us at Iowa State. And um, it's a little bit of a story, and it's a little bit of a hopeful story, I think. And it's one that um, I'm finding maybe many of our students need to hear more of because I, in addition to research, I teach uh, undergrads and graduates. And many of them come out of class saying, wow, everything's a bummer. You know, everything is bad. Uh, so I'd like to share what I think is maybe a, a hopeful story. So what's the problem? Well, a lot of this I think we all know. Uh, monarchs, uh, one of our charismatic pollinators, are in decline. We've heard about that already. Uh, North American bees are in decline. The some 4,000 species in North America, at least eight now are listed as endangered. Our na uh, managed non-native honeybees, our beekeepers report at least 30% per year, if not more, losses. Um, and, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where it's not just isolated populations like in Hawaii, but now continental, we've listed the rusty patch bumblebee as endangered. A working hypothesis that many of my colleagues use to understand this is um, sometimes abbreviated the three Ps. Pesticides, including those used for uh, the soybean aphid like pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. Pathogens and parasites, we heard about the possibly newest addition to this category. Uh, and then overall, as Golson pointed out in his figures, poor forage or limited floral resources. And this really stands out in Iowa. Uh, again, fly over here. Here's Iowa, where I call home. Uh, something like 86% of Iowa is dedicated to farmland. And that farmland is very productive. We're some of the most productive soils in the world, committed to corn and soybean production, um, which is great uh, in the sense of contributing to agriculture, but it leaves uh, an environment that looks like this, which in a uh, newspaper article by the Minnesota Tribune described as fields of a green, a desert for bees. What they mean by a green desert is it's green, it's very productive for agriculture, but outside of the floral resources that those crops provide, it's a desert for things like bees. So then the question is, is there a solution? So not limited to me or us at Iowa State, but many have noted that if we're looking for an answer, we might look to what the landscape looked like before European settlers um, came to Iowa in the Midwest. And prairie, tall grass prairie, uh, covered most of that region. Some, I think, groundbreaking work that was done um, early in the uh, 2000s by a group out of Michigan State University, Juliano now Wilson, uh, Rufus Isaacs, and Doug Landis, noted that visitation by wild and managed bees to individual plants in this prairie were uh, highly attractive to native and managed bees. So if we're thinking about how to solve this problem, we might ask, where can we practice production and conservation at the same time? And this is the focus of the STRIPS project, which is an acronym, science-based trials of row crops with prairie strips. One of the fundamental issues or hypotheses that this, our group is looking to address is if you take a little bit of land out of production, do you get disproportionate benefits? Do you get even more than what you had uh, in production? And to answer that question, well, of course, we have a logo, uh, but we have a large community, a multidisciplinary team that includes ecologists, ornithologists, ag engineers, weed scientists, uh, sociologists, uh, somewhere in here is my colleague John Tyndall, an economist. Oh, buried deep in here is me, an entomologist. And a variety of university, government, and NGOs working to help address this question. A driver for this question is not pollinators. Hmm. It's this. You know, the business end of farming is the soil. And for eight months out of the year in much of the Midwest, that soil is bare. And with increasing uh, extremities and in weather, 
brought on by climate change, that soil is at risk for erosion, as you see here. So one of the first steps, the first phase, was to research and demonstrate how on small experimental watersheds, a little bit of prairie could act as a barrier to that uh, erosion. And this is what it looks like. There's um, a treatment here, one of many that were replicated, where 20% of the, uh, the land is taken out of production. And at the base and then in strips going up the watershed, you have prairie. And down at the base of this watershed where the water would come to collect is a funnel. And that funnel measures sediment loss and nutrients lost from, uh, you know, that were added as fertilizer. Now, all of the data has been published on this. This is uh, a little bit dated, uh, maybe five, six years now. Um, but what I'm going to show you is not the data, but what it looks like after a four-plus inch rain event occurs within a 24-hour period. A uh, substantial amount of rain in a short period of time. So this is what it looks like when that watershed is 100% corn. And this is corn grown with no-till, which is thought to be a way of reducing soil erosion. This is a similar watershed, but now 100% prairie. So I'm seeing a lot of people shake, nod their heads and go, oh, that looks great. And it does, but we can't go back to this. We need the land in production in order to meet our growing human population. So what if we sacrifice 10%? And with that 10% of land taken out of production, we see a 90% reduction in sediment loss and similar reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus, which contribute to the anoxic zone of the base of watersheds. So that was one of the aha moments from this project. In sharing this work with farmers, agribusiness, extension, um, we moved on to phase two, where individuals asked if they could do this on their own farm. And this is the kind of reaction we got, where they wanted to see what we had shown at the demonstration level at a commercial scale. Since then, the USDA in the 2018 Farm Bill has added prairie strips as a conservation practice that would help farmers recoup the cost lost in production by adding this reconstructed prairie to their landscape. Now, there are other practices that can help do this, but this is specifically to the practice that we uh, have developed at Iowa State. So with the remainder of the time, more for this audience, is I want to ask how good is the solution for insects? And I want to remind you multiple times, and I'm told that redundancy is a good form of education, so I apologize. Um, but all of what I'm going to show you is coming from an on-farm setting where commercial, conventional corn and soybeans are being grown. This is not organic farms. This is not research farms where we've limited the inputs in the adjacent crop. Herbicides, insecticides, tillage, if needed, is being done adjacent to these prairie strips. So how did we assess how good prairie strips are in this setting? Well, we did a compared, study, a compared study where we had multiple prairie strip sites with this high diversity seed mix at field contours or stream edges. Sometimes these prairie strips are embedded in the field like you see here. And we compared them to other perennial non-cropped habitat that would be found in an Iowa landscape, like a roadside here or a grass waterway. Excuse me. And we had a team of uh, graduate students funded through uh, FFAR. And one of them, Caroline Murray, would go out monthly and do transects within those non-cropped habitats and count the number of flowering species. Early in June, okay, so on this y-axis is the average number of flowering plant species. And early in the uh, year, very similar, but statistically and numerically we see more flower diversity more flowering plant diversity uh, in the fields with prairie strips than those without, the uh, green being control, the yellow being prairie strips. She also painstakingly counted the number of flowers. So on this y-axis is the mean number of blooming flowers, and again, the same time period. The green is control, the yellow is prairie strips. Again, not too surprisingly, similar number of uh, um, flowers early, but especially by August and September, two orders of magnitude increase in flowering. And that's remarkable, especially given that around that time, she's also seeing our biggest difference in the number of monarchs. So this is adult obs observations in those habitats, 
And statistically, numerically, there were more in the prairie strip than the control, but that really comes into, uh, into uh, fruition in August. And we think that's because even though there's not that much milkweed in these prairie strips, there are a lot of flowers, and these adults are using this as a refueling station as they make their way south. Along the way, uh, our colleagues, Farnaz Kornbach, Mary Harris, and Matt Liebman, uh, did a comparison study uh, looking at the number of native bees, both the abundance and diversity. And this was recently, excuse me, recently published in PLOS One, strips of prairie vegetation placed within row crops can sustain native bee communities. And this is just a, a brief visual summary of some of the most commonly observed bees that were found more in the prairie strips than in uh, cropland. But given what I just told you about my background and what we do in Iowa, kind of an obvious question is, are these bees being exposed to neonicotinoids, one of the most commonly used insecticides in our part of the world? And this is a question that we tried to answer with another graduate student, Maura Hall, and a team of toxicologists, Steve Bradbury and Joel Coates, in a paper that just came out this February, quantifying neonicotinoid insecticide residues in milkweed and other forbs sampled from prairie strips established in maize and soybean fields. So that's what we did. And what did we find? Well, when we, when we went looking for neonics, we deliberately picked what we thought was the worst case situation. Prairie strips that were embedded in a field uh, with the water flowing down them so that we would collect soil. We would look for neonics in the soil at this topmost edge, and then uh, we did this throughout the season, so starting uh, before planting and then going towards uh, harvest. We also picked uh, leaf material from flowering plants throughout the season with a focus on milkweed, but not limited to milkweed. And we asked our toxicologists to collect bees in the act of foraging on these flowering plants in an attempt to see what they're exposed to in the act of foraging within the prairie strips. One other thing I want you to note in this picture is we put this sentinel hive, these sentinel hives, this apiary of honeybees, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But in terms of finding what bees are exposed to in the prairie strips, Maura Hall is demonstrating how a toxicologist collects bees. She uses this vacuum cleaner and she sucks up the bees as they're visiting the flowers, brings them back to the lab, extracts the pollen and the nectar from their honey stomachs, and then looks for uh, using um, Gas, gas phase chromatography, the presence of the three commonly used neonicotinoids. Now, uh, there's quite a bit of data to share. I don't have time to go into all of it, so I'm just going to give a brief summary to give you some idea of the trends that we're seeing. So what I've shown here in this table is the location of where we went looking for neonics, and then in this column is the percentage of time we found at least one neonicotinoid in a sample. And so these are samples, oh, sorry, these are samples that were taken from June, July, August into September. And every time we looked for neonics in the soil, we found at least one. In the plant tissue, the leaves of milkweed and other flowering plants, 80% of the time at least one neonicotinoid was found. But when we went looking into the nectar and pollen, we start to see a substantial decrease. And then this led us to the question of, okay, so doesn't look as if as much uh, neonicotinoid exposure is happening given what's in the soil and in the plants. Uh, what happens in a honeybee colony where it could be concentrated, where it could bioaccumulate? So Gu Zhang, the third student supported on this project, would look to those sentinel colonies and these little apiaries and collect the bees that are on this brood frame. So uh, I think Sammy did a really good job of explaining to us where bees are raised on this frame are the nurse bees that would intercept the forage coming into the colony, feed that to the babies, the larvae that are in there. So we looked to them to see if they are accumulating neonicotinoids. And what we found when those bees were collected, uh, less than 1% had a neonicotinoid in them. So to kind of wrap up with a few bullet points, the work of our toxicologists, and the one paper that's published and another that's in review, the frequency and concentration of neonics declines from soil to nectar to honeybees when kept in a prairie strip. The concentrations, and I didn't talk about uh, the concentrations, I just told you the percent of time we detected them, but the concentrations of neonic 
neonicotinoids are orders of magnitude below the LC10 for monarch larvae. Not the LC50, but the LC10. And I should point out, somewhat anecdotally, but I'm going to go into more detail, that we did not observe honeybee colony deaths in the three years of this study. Every time we put bees out of these prairie strips, starting in June and going until September, all our colonies survived. And this was not an attempt to study necessarily the insecticide use on honeybees, but to see how honeybees would respond to the floral resources in a prairie strip. So Ge Zhang, now a postdoc at Washington State University, set up this paired comparison. He started with two colonies in 2017, but thanks to um, funding, uh, we were able to expand to four. And when he did this experiment, he started with the weights of the colonies, all the same size. So in early June, when he puts them out, they're all about 10 kilos. And then those at the control sites grow as we would expect in our part of the world. Um, by August, they've peaked in terms of their weight. And that weight is not in the hardware, it's in the nectar that is being converted to honey. Right? So this colony weight is a proxy for the estimation of honey production. And as you can see here, hives kept at a control site weighed less than those kept at a prairie strip site. And these asterisks indicate when that difference was statistically significant. So this is, oh, excuse me, this is work that's in review uh, in uh, Journal of Applied Ecology. This is sort of the egg heady way of showing this data. I'm gonna show you what it would look like from the perspective of a beekeeper. So this is some hives. This is an apiary of four hives. Each one of these uh, towers of boxes represents one colony. So this is what it looks like in August. Just before beekeepers in Iowa would start to harvest, there's three boxes here. This is what it looks like at a prairie strip site. We had to put an additional box on top of that column to provide the bees enough storage for the additional nectar that they're bringing into their colonies. This represents the 24% increase in honey production that we've seen when bees have access to prairie strips. So to kind of wrap up, what do we get from prairie strips? Again, in an on-farm commercial setting where growers are growing conventionally. Prairie strips increase the number of flowers, increase flowering plant diversity, increase the abundance of pollinators, and they increase honeybee productivity. And again, I apologize for being redundant, but all of this occurred on commercial farms using herbicides and insecticides, including neonicotinoid seed treatments. To date, we have no evidence that these prairie strips are an ecological sink. If anything, our evidence is suggesting that they're increasing the abundance and diversity of our native bees, as well as the productivity of managed honeybees. To wrap up, I wanna thank our insect response field team, whose data I shared with you today, Caroline Murray, Maura Hall, and Gu Zhang. And then this is a huge team effort, and just on the insect side, there were several of my colleagues at Iowa State, um, Lisa Schulte Moore, John Tyndall, Amy Toth, an honest-to-goodness honey biologist, our two toxicologists, Joel Coates and Steve Bradbury, and then at the time he was with us, Adam Dolezal, who's now, who was a postdoc, uh, but now a, a professor, assistant professor at Iowa State University. If I haven't quelched your interest in prairie strips, please look us up online. The URL is here. We have an email. We also tweet. Uh, this is the NASCAR slide to show you all of the, no, this is not exhaustive, uh, this is just a subset of the many uh, organizations that have helped us, and, and missing from here is Bear Crop Science, Syngenta, and BASF who helped with uh, the neonic, uh, neonicotinoid um, work that we did. Um, if you're ever at a loss and you want to learn more, I promise you this is safe for work, you can Google strips at Iowa State University and you'll come up with our website. I believe I did it. 20 minutes? All right, good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some time for questions, so hang out here for a moment. We'll see if anyone in the room has questions. And Amber will get ready with some if we have any online. But Laura, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. That was a great presentation. I'm Laura Morandon from Pollinator Partnership. And I'm curious about the ground nesting bees. I know this is a huge project and you haven't touched on all of it, but I wonder what you're finding with ground nesting bees with 100% of that soil being impacted. And if it's 
somehow, is it a sink for them possibly in the nesting stage or the overwintering stage? So bunch yeah, of questions that's there. That's a great question. So just to recap, uh, I'm assuming people online could hear, but um, yeah, what happens to ground nesters that are in this habitat that potentially is constantly exposed to neonics? Um, one thing I might say is we've surveyed the bee communities in corn and soybean fields, and pollinators persist in those despite the disturbance regime. What's a little bit disturbing, sorry for the double use, is that over 60, close to 70 percent of the bees that we find in corn and soybean fields are ground nesters, or I should say pollinators are ground nesters, and uh, they are not well studied. We only have so many resources. We focused on honeybees because those are easily manipulated. We can measure fitness. We can measure, you know, the forage. Much, much harder to do with the soil nesting bee. So it's a big question mark as to if honeybees are the best indicator species for bees in this environment. So, sorry, I can't be more uh, informative on that. Uh, Lori Adams, Pollinator Partnership. It was a great presentation. Can you give us any ideas how well you suspect this might work in other cropping systems? And also the notion of the need for buffers, whether that is something that is important or a waste of space or what you would say about those two things. Um, so uh, just to paraphrase, uh, how useful would this be in other cropping systems? and the value of buffers in general. Um, so in terms of buffers in general, I might note that uh, other states have a more proactive top-down approach. Minnesota uh, has a buffer law that requires landowners to put a buffer between their farmland and a body of water. That's a very top-down approach, um, and prairie strips could be uh, appropriate for that setting. So far in Iowa, it's voluntary. And what we're seeing is that even before it became a practice within CRP where farmers could get some support, we already had the early adopters. And uh, what we found in surveys is something like 80% of Iowans that are surveyed know about prairie strips. So we've got pretty good word of mouth. Uh, the challenge now is to see if we can get the big bulk on that innovator curve, you know, the, the, that is the, the majority of landowners. In terms of expanding this beyond corn and soybeans, um, some of this is already being explored, especially out of Michigan State. Michigan has the second most diverse agricultural landscape in, in the Union, and the blueberry growers there have explored wildflowers as a way to not only enhance pollinators, but also natural enemies. And so one thing going forward, if we want to sell this type of practice to the majority of our farmers, I think we have to meet them where they are. Right? They are not... The, especially in corn and soybean land, they do not benefit from pollination. And what they benefit from is preventing soil erosion and potentially uh, pest outbreaks. So if there's a role for prairie strips or any kind of uh, field adjacent habitat to improve biological control, that would be a good thing. And again, I just kind of point out, we did not comment prairie strips as a way to improve pollinators. It was sort of a secondary benefit but it's one that um, is pretty powerful. So I suspect that uh, similar situations are out there where in trying to address other ecological issues, there could be a role for pollinator uh, conservation. All right, I think that's all the time for questions we have. So thank you again to Dr. O'Neill. Wonderful presentation. Um, and I will invite Vicki Finn back up to bring us into our next presentation. Hello again. Um, for our next presentation, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kelsey Graham. Kelsey is a research entomologist with USDA AR ARS Pollinating Insects Research Unit. Kelsey's research includes understanding pesticide exposure and risk to both managed and wild bees in agricultural landscapes, optimizing the management of non-apis bees for crop pollination, and monitoring changes in wild bee communities across diverse landscapes. I'll now, now invite Kelsey to come on up for her presentation. Pesticide exposure is a landscape, not farm scale problem for managed bees.
this will work. No. No, I'm not. Oh, because Matt went back. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Now if we can get that up on the big screen. Perfect. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And really, thank you to the organizers. It's a real honor to be here and be able to talk about some of my work. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a research entomologist with the USDA ARS now, but um, a lot of the talk that I, or a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today um, is from my postdoc work at Michigan State University, primarily working in high bush blueberry. Um, and then at the end, I'll actually talk about some of my current work uh, working in alfalfa for seed production, um, working with alkali bees. So some background on highbush blueberry. Um, it is a pollinator-dependent crop, so it requires insect-mediated pollen movement to optimize yields. And the majority of blueberry growers will bring in um, commercial honeybees, so they contract with commercial beekeepers to bring in honeybee hives. And honeybees are um, the majority of pollination services for highbush blueberry. But then there's an increasing number of blueberry growers that also um, purchase and bring in managed bumblebee colonies for pollination as well. We have um, increasing data that having a diversity of pollinators is really beneficial for optimizing yields, and especially in blueberry. Of course, as we've all heard about many times, um, there are growing concerns about managed pollinators. Um, beekeepers with blueberry contracts in Michigan report really high rates of colony loss and high incidence of European fowl brood in Michigan in particular. There's also a believed association between um, blueberry pollination and colony loss, and this is true for Michigan beekeepers as well as elsewhere, as shown here. Um, but we really don't have a good understanding of how to link one crop with poor outcomes for commercial uh, honeybee colonies. Just because they are going into so many different crops, um, it's often hard to make that link. But, um, but yeah, that's something we keep trying to do. Another complicating factor is that there are lots of different threats to pollinators, again, as we've all been already talking about. Um, my work in particular is focused on understanding pesticide exposure for um, both managed and wild bees. Um, today I'm going to talk primarily about managed bees. Um, and this is particularly important for uh, pollinators of um, pollination or pollinator dependent crops because you have this balancing act that's happening where growers need good pollination, so they need to be supporting and making sure that the colonies are healthy while in, on their farms for pollination, but they also need to be controlling um, pests and pathogens. Um, for blueberry during bloom, they are controlling for things like anthracnose, which is a disease that can really reduce um, fruit yields, as well as insect pests like fruit worms. So it's really this balancing act that's happening, especially during bloom, where the grower and beekeeper need to work together to, to kind of balance both of those needs. And this brings me to my um, primary research question, which is, do managed bees face elevated risks from pesticides while on blueberry farms for pollination? Because this really wasn't something that we had a good grasp about. We really didn't know what is typical um, like field exposure for managed bees while they're on blueberry farms for pollination. When we think about risk, it's a combination of both um, exposure and toxicity. So exposure in this context is the concentration of pesticides in a sample. So um, we're going to take, I'll show in a second, we take all these different kinds of samples that are relevant to bees um, and then measure them for both how many pesticides are in the sample as well as what concentrations we're seeing. And exposure can happen um, through different exposure routes and the two that we'll focus on today is contact exposure and oral exposure. That's largely because of toxicity, which is the second part of risk, um, and that is the lethal dose um, known to kill 50% of honeybees or bumblebees in this context as well. Um, and uh, this toxicity data is known 
mostly for honeybees, and we have both contact toxicity data and um, oral exposure route toxicity data. And generally, we have a pretty good understanding of toxicity for honeybees um, for most pesticides. Um, it's a lot more limited for bumblebees, um, but that continues to grow, which is great. But we really have a poor understanding of um, exposure for most pesticides and in most contexts. Um, so this is where we really were trying to fill that gap. So to uh, measure pesticide exposure on blueberry farms during pollination, uh, we worked on 15 farms in two years, and we collected blueberry uh, flowers while they were in bloom on farms. We collected whole bees while they were foraging at blueberry flowers. We collected bee collected pollen, so as they're foraging and then bringing pollen back to the colony, we collected it there, as well as honeybee wax. And then we uh, screened all of these sample types for 291 active ingredients, and um, this work was done by Scott McCart's lab at Cornell University. So once we have that exposure data, um, we can then estimate risk to bees, as not all pesticides are created equal. Um, again, toxicity can be very different based on different pesticides. So um, we estimate risk using a risk quotient, which is the percent of the toxicity level. So that's the LD50 again, where 50% of honeybees are expected to die um, within 48 hours. We can then take that risk quotient and relate it to the EPA and the European Food Safety Authority levels of concern. So this is where the EPA and EFSA would take um, a pesticide that's under risk assessment and move it from a tier one uh, lab study and elevate it to a tier two semi-field study. So there's enough reason to be concerned about that pesticide to move it up to a semi-field study. And for the EPA, uh, the level of concern is 40% of the LD50, and that is for acute contact exposure. And for the EFSA level of concern, that's 20% of the LD50. They're slightly different from the EPA in that way. Um, and they also have a very similar um, chronic oral exposure level of concern, which would be 3% of the LD50. This is a somewhat complicated graph, so I apologize, <laughs> but I will take you through it. So the um, y-axis is showing the sample risk quotient, and again, that is the percent of the LD50. Um, and then we have the different sample types along the x-axis, and each of those dots is the sample risk quotient. And the sample risk quotient is the summation of all risks from all of the pesticides we're detecting in each sample. So, um, for all pollen samples, for example, we had at least 12 active ingredients in each sample. So that's the summation of all of the risks from each of those individual pesticides. And I think the, the main takeaway from this really is that um, exposure through bee collected pollen represented the highest risk to bees. And I've put the, the dashed lines on there are each of those levels of concern um, for both um, the European Food Safety Authority and um, the EPA. And most pollen samples were above the EFSA level of concern for chronic oral exposure. And that's relevant for pollen as both adults and larvae will consume pollen, so that's a relevant route of exposure for them. And it's also worth noting that um, we also had some samples that were above both the EPA and the EFSA level of concern for acute um, contact toxicity as well. So it was driving these um, high-risk exposures. So um, clothianidin was, um, it's a neonicotinoid insecticide and it has um, pretty high toxicity for bees. So um, not surprising that it was driving a lot of our higher risk uh, samples. And the highest detection in honeybee pollen represented 89% of the LD50. So as a reminder again, LD50 is where you'd expect 50% of the honeybees to die um, within 48 hours, and we were at 89% of that, so relatively high. So clothianidin is not registered for use on blueberry fields at any time of the year. Uh, it is a common seed treatment for corn and soybean um, and in a variety of other crops. 
And post-bloom applications um, on apple and cherry orchards could align with the timing of blueberry bloom. So in this region of Michigan, um, it's a pretty diverse cropping area, and they have a lot of apple and cherry orchards next to blueberry farms. So, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Chlorpyrifos was another one that um, stood out to us. It's an organophosphate insecticide, um, and it was detected in 97% of honeybee and 100% of bumblebee pollen samples in 2019. And the highest detection in bumblebee collected pollen represented 12% of the LD50. And again, as a reminder, 4% of the LD50 would be where the EPA would move it from a tier one to a tier two study. Again, this insecticide is not registered for use on blueberries at any time of the year. It is registered um, for trunk applications in vineyards and orchards, as well as used on corn and other field crops. We can also look at um, whether or not all of the pesticides that we're detecting in these samples are registered or not registered for use on blueberry at any time of the year. Um, those, and then look at their contribution to risk. So um, the gray bar um, is those products that are not registered for use on blueberry at any time of year. So, and those are the ones that are contributing the most to risk. So risk must be coming from outside of the farm where they're placed for pollination. Because again, these products are not registered for use at any time of year um, on, on blueberry farms. So given that, um, where are these risky exposures occurring? And I think this is kind of the, the big question if we wanna try to reduce high risk exposures for managed bees. We um, did some landscape analyses, so looking at the proportion of the surrounding landscape um, around honeybee and bumblebee colonies, um, and we, they were classified into different land uses. And we did this at three relevant um, foraging radiuses for these bees. Um, this map just shows the area of Michigan that we are working in. Um, each of those circles or triangles are um, the, the farms that we are working on, and then the blue is the um, fields that are in blueberry production. So a lot of blueberry in this region, but also a lot of other things. Uh, so about one-third of the surrounding landscape was um, crops. Uh, blueberry was the most abundant single crop um, around most of these farms, which is not very surprising given that they are on blueberry farms. Um, but we also had other crops like apples and cherries, as I mentioned previously, and then other crops was primarily field crops. Um, a lot of them were rotating, so we kind of grouped them together um, as other crops, um, again, a lot of corn and soybean, but other field crops as well. We can then do um, correlational analyses um, to look at which of these landscape types um, might be correlated with elevated sample risk. And the only significant correlation that we find is between um, apple and cherry or orchard acreage. So as that increases, we see increasing levels um, or increasing risk in samples. And I think it's particularly worth noting, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but blueberry acreage was never correlated um, with sample risk quotient. So we really don't think that these high risk exposures during blueberry pollination are coming um, from the blueberry management itself. We can also look at what um, pollens these bees are bringing back to, again, try to understand where this risk is coming from. Um, generally, bumblebees and honeybees forage at different crops. Uh, bumblebees are on the bottom here, and they collect a lot more blueberry pollen. They also collect from a wider diversity of plants. Um, and of course, the source of exposure could be crop pollen, but um, as I've already mentioned several times, we don't think that's likely as blueberry is the main crop pollen here. Um, and for all the reasons I've already said, um, we don't think that these higher risk exposures are coming from blueberry pollen itself. Therefore, uh, we think it's more likely that agricultural weeds are the culprit here, um, given their proximity to pest management, um, their abundance in the landscape, as well as um, the preference of these bees to collect them for pollen. Exposure through agricultural weeds um, is not a new concept. So um, there was another project um, out of Michigan that looked at collection of pollens from agricultural weeds, and it was associated with an increase in the neonicotinoids thymethoxam and clothianidin. 
And Scott McCart's lab at Cornell also found a positive correlation between the diversity of pollens that were collected by honeybees and increasing risk. So what does that mean um, for minimizing risk to manage bees? I think our data, as well as others, point um, that diverse landscapes with mixed agriculture may be particularly risky um, for generalist eusocial bees like managed honeybees and bumblebees. The greatest risk um, from pesticides came from products that are not registered for use on blueberry bushes at any time of the year. And I think, unfortunately, some of the traits that make honeybees and bumblebees such great pollinators um, also potentially puts them at risk um, from, higher, from these exposures on other landscapes. Uh, they collect from a, a wide group of plants, they're generalists, um, and they have large foraging ranges. And I think um, understanding pesticide exposure um, of another managed bee complements this idea. So uh, Nomium melanderi, the alkali bee, um, is a bee that I currently work on. It is a solitary ground nesting bee and it's managed for pollination of alfalfa grown for seed in eastern Washington. It's really beautiful, it has like these iridescent bands on it and it nests in these managed bee beds. So um, growers will manage on um, these bee beds. Um, you can see it's right up next to that alfalfa field um, and the bees nest in there and they are really great um, pollinators of alfalfa and, and increase their uh, seed yield substantially. It's also a generalist with a large foraging range similar um, to honeybees and bumblebees. We can again look at their pollen, see what they're bringing back. It's primarily alfalfa with a little bit of mix of other things like bindweed and mayweed. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is that this landscape is very much do dominated by alfalfa and wheat. So 45% of the surrounding landscape around these managed bee beds is in alfalfa production with then 30% in wheat, which really doesn't provide um, many resources for bees. So this landscape is really quite unique in that it really is almost all alfalfa and wheat and a couple other crops. So very different from the Michigan landscape. When we look at pesticides in their pollen provisions, um, that's a little picture of a, a Nomian nest. Um, we find no elevated risks from pesticide exposures. We had no detections above the EPA or EFSA levels of concern, and all were well below 1% of the LD50s. The most abundant pesticide is flunicamid or belief, um, and this is applied, during alfalfa, at, applied to alfalfa during bloom, and it has really low toxicity for bees. I think low pesticide exposure risk for these bees is likely because alkali bee flight period overlaps with alfalfa bloom. And growers are the ones that are both managing the bees and managing the crop. And they love these bees and they take a lot of time and care to think about how they can protect them. Uh, they avoid high risk insecticides when they know that the alkali bees are flying. I think it's also really interesting that management of alkali bees has been really successful in eastern Washington, but it has failed everywhere else. Um, so this bee has a pretty wide range across the western United States, and they've attempted to manage this bee in other areas um, of, al of alfalfa seed production. Um, and it's been hypothesized that these other management um, attempts have failed because they're being exposed to pesticides from other crops. So I think it's possible that this unique landscape in eastern Washington where it's almost entirely alfalfa and wheat may actually provide a relatively safe landscape for them. So I think in diversified agricultural landscapes, our data suggests that reducing exposure off the focal farm uh, should be the priority for mitigating risk to bees, uh, particularly those with large foraging ranges. Risks of applications should be considered at the broader landscape level, not just at the farm or the field level. Possible ways to uh, reduce exposures include reducing pesticide applications during and outside of bloom through the use of integrated pest management, uh, choosing reduced risk, pro risk products year round, and removing potential sources of exposure. And I think um, our data shows that, again, weeds might be, or 
be attractive weeds. It might be a particularly risky source of pesticide exposure for some bees. Um, so perhaps removing weeds um, right before uh, a high-risk insecticide is applied um, could be a potential route of lowering that risk. So yeah, so I have a lot of people to thank, all the um, blueberry collaborators and alfalfa collaborators, as well as my funding sources. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. All right, wonderful presentation. And if we have any questions in the room, we can take those. I have a question for you, a very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, your, um, your insight that agricultural weeds may be a route of exposure to pesticides it was making me wonder if Michigan, and especially where you were doing your work, is mm -hmm. plagued by herbicide-resistant weeds. I, I mean, I don't, well, <laughs> that's a tricky question um, because I think in like orchards and um, blueberry fields, they're not necessarily working very hard to control weeds. So I don't think in those landscapes, they're necessarily gonna, you're gonna find herbicide resistant weeds. Um, in other landscapes maybe, and I really don't know the answer to that, but yeah, they, there isn't much control of weeds. <laughs> in, and, and just remind me, you didn't have yeah. much corn and soybeans around your farms? We did, it varied a lot. We had a couple of fields that were near corn and soybean farms, but most of them were not. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yep. Let's see, Amber, did we have any questions from online? Uh, we had one. Um, are prairie strips different than farm-associated weeds? Than farm associated weeds, is that what you mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So, <laughs> farm associated weeds are typically things like clovers, dandelions, um, those types of things that um, may or may not, again, be managed uh, by growers. Um, yeah, so that's primarily where we think some of this might be coming from, but I don't know if I can go back or not. But if you look at, oh, bindweed's a good one for alfalfa, but that's specific to that. <laughs> yeah, so. Let's see what we have here. Yeah, here's the agricultural weeds are um, highlighted by the boxes, if that helps at all. I'm sorry, I should have probably put the common names of these, that's my bad. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, primarily the weeds that you think of kind of growing on lawns, um, that's typically what you see on the, the understories of orchards as well. I just don't know enough about the natural history of honeybee. Can, do they get all of the nectar that they need from blueberry? Can they only get pollen from blueberry? And would that mean that blueberry were a special case in terms of mm -hmm. uh, likelihood of leaving your primary crop to have to search elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think this, I'm glad I'm on this slide because as you can see, the honeybees are on the top here um, and blue is blueberry pollen and they're really not collecting a lot of blueberry pollen. So um, they primarily nectar on blueberry crop um, instead of collecting pollen. So um, it's likely that they're going elsewhere to get that protein source. Um, so yeah, this might be a relatively unique system for that, yeah. All right, and I'll invite Vicki back up to bring us into our final keynote. Okay, while she's doing that, I want to introduce our last presentation in this public session, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Wagner. David is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Connecticut with core research interest in the biosystematics of Lepidoptera, insect decline, and invertebrate conservation. Much of his current focus is on the consequences of global insect declines, and especially the role of drought as a primary driver of faunal change across arid lands and the tropics. So I'll now invite David up on stage for his presentation on conservation of pollinating Lepidoptera.
We'll see how this goes. I haven't given this talk before. I even had an opportunity to talk about uh, pollinating, pollinating Lepidoptera. So thanks for the invite and thanks for organizing this meeting. It's been great to hear the talks have been fantastic. I added another title as well. So I'm, I, I think moths are very neglected as pollinators. Uh, you know, a lot of times about the time you want to go in for dinner, have your you know, drinks or whatever, uh, that's about the time my guys get started. And so we're really missing uh, an awful lot, uh, particularly in many ecosystems where moths may be playing a role. So again, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, as you already mentioned, Vicki, I'm a lepidopterist, and, and so I, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about moths, but um, especially, um, especially their caterpillars, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, I, I've been studying lepidoptering conservation or been involved with it since I got my degree at Berkeley, so uh, let's see if this... Um, I got, so I was on the east side, um, and San Bruno Mountain was across the way, and that's where I sort of cut my teeth on invertebrate conservation. And uh, that was one of the best examples in the United States of triage, where the developers got something, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife got something, and we, we carved up San Bruno Mountain, uh, but with all the people that uh, moved into the developments there, they were paying a tax. And it worked out just phenomenally in the sense that uh, con the conservationists there had a tremendous budget uh, to hire full-time biologists and uh, remove the invasive species. Uh, these butterflies are still doing uh, quite well there. And uh, just a, a wonderful example of working together uh, with people with different interests, like Lori mentioned, uh, to come up with a common solution. And it really worked out well here for the animals. I, I do a little bit with butterflies, but I'm mostly a moth person, but I, I do work with a northern metal mark in terms of conservation biology. Here, I was working with restoration biology, and we, we uh, were managing habitat for years and, 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 and spin our wheels, and then all of a sudden, after like the seventh or eighth year, um, it really kicked in, and we brought the, tripled the butterflies population. Uh, we do a little bit with, the fro I'm working on the frosted elfin butterfly now, um, and recently com completed a uh, mark recapture study. But I'm actually up here in front of you I, in large measure because of my love and passion for these animals. So if you don't know, I, I work on caterpillars a, a lot. So they're not pollinators yet, but they will be. They want to be uh, pollinators. Uh, so uh, I, I find these incredible animals, and I'm worried about them. Uh, I'm very worried about their conservation and uh, how climate change is going to be uh, driving many of these species uh, to extirpation locally, and uh, I hope not um, to ex extinction, you know, permanently. But these, you know, these are fantastic animals. I just got back from Arizona. You're seeing animals. I think six of these no one has ever seen before. You're seeing them for the first time. So I'm really interested in working out. I mean, I. I I have this like moral imperative to get portraits of these animals and tell their stories before, before they're gone. And so uh, I, I'm out there trying to break life histories and understand their insect plant associations. Very, very important. But uh, I think six of these have never been seen before. And uh, they're exquisite and worth our attention. And they certainly need us to act as stewards on their behalf because they don't get to vote and they don't get to participate. They don't get to be here. And, and so we have to do what we can to, to, to protect these, these animals. Um, the caterpillars are also important for another reason. So I, you know, I'm supposed to talk about pollinators, and um, the caterpillars are pollinators, but lepidopter are enormously important. Um, they uh, are uh, the very fabric of many terrestrial ecosystems. Um, they transfer more energy from plants to other animals. So they're, they're like the hamburger out there that everybody else is eating. So if you, if you really um, you know, think, think about birds, for example, uh, they, they play an incredible role in, in terms of making baby birds. And uh, spring would be very silent if it weren't for these caterpillars. Um, it, they're, they're so common and, and so important that in terms of uh, insect-plant interactions, uh, we know that uh, plants, uh, what they look like, uh, how they shape their leaves, uh, uh, especially the secondary compounds in those plants are really shaped in large measure by caterpillars. And those compounds in those leaves enrich our lives in so many ways, but that's another lecture for another day, and uh, maybe I'll be even invited back someday to, to talk about those things. 
And, and so I, I tell you, I work on Moz, and, and many of you, and you maybe have invited me or thought you were uh, going to listen to a talk about pollinator conservation, that I talk about butterflies. Um, I might not. Um, but I, I just want to remind you that butterflies are not even a natural group. This is the phylogeny worked out by Akito Kawahara, uh, Florida, University of Florida. And um, butterflies are just two different lineages of day flying moths. And they've recently found out that this group of moths is actually inserted between uh, the skipper butterflies and the regular butterflies. So it's a totally artificial group. Uh, you know, butterflies are just moths that fly around in the daytime, but there's probably across this tree of, of life for, for Lepidoptera, there might be no less than 50 different origins of diurnality or, or moths that fly around in the daytime. So there's a lot of them. So I think there's about 20,000 bees uh, worldwide. Uh, we've described about 157,000 species of butterflies and moths. And I think that there's about 300,000 or more. So well, we've got a long way to go, and I'm afraid that some of these might be eliminated even before we get them in collections, let alone describe them. So there's a lot going on at night. So you know, after you go to bed, whatever, uh, there's about 16 species of, of moths for every butterfly that you may be thinking about when you think about uh, lepidopter or, or moth or um, butterfly pollination services. So butterfly pollination, uh, th th there's certain um, attributes or, or traits that butterfly flowers have. Uh, there often there's a platform for them to sit on in many cases. Uh, a lot of red or pink flowers are either uh, butterfly pollinated or hummingbird pollinated. And um, I'm, not, I'm not certain if we eliminate, uh, you, may, you may not want to hear this, but uh, if we eliminate all the butterflies, I don't know that there would be a single plant that would go extinct because we did. You know, bees do a lot of the, the pollination um, services, the ecosystem service, ecosystem functions that we need. Um, but I you know, absolutely love butterflies and enrich our journey, and, and we have a, a moral and ethical imperative to, to do all we can for these species. Um, this is a beautiful butterfly garden uh, with just a couple. Uh, you, you can see the landing platforms uh, in both cases. So, um, but, but after you go to bed, there's a lot more happening. So even milkweed, I, I can't tell you how important milkweed is to moths at night. And, and so we could lose the monarch and, and the, the milkweed would definitely still be pollinated by uh, a number of other um, insects but are very rich moth fauna. This is a, a bloom in Connecticut with one, two, three, four, uh, 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 you know, five or six moths uh, servicing a single bloom. It's really fun to sit out in a, a lawn chair, you know, get your glass of wine and, and a lawn chair and sit out at, at dusk. I, I think you could actually uh, do a lot of citizen science by, by uh, uh, watching who's coming and uh, who, who some of the players are. We, we just don't know. I mean, American chestnut, it was a major tree. 50% of our forests in certain parts of the eastern United States I just really figured out recently that it was probably moth pollinated. It's a great big white fragrant flower. It's got to be moth pollinated. And we, we don't even know what the major pollinators are at this point in time. Um, so moth pollination uh, with or without landing pr platforms, obviously this, the sphingids don't need them. Often white flowers, that's a dead giveaway. If you have a, well, a white flower, it's almost always going to be uh, a moth pollinated. This is one of my favorite things. It should be one of your favorite things. I have a slide I'm going to read to you from my, um, my, my Western Caterpillar book in a second. Um, nectar, often hidden very deep. They don't want to share your nectar. So, you know, it's one thing to be a flower. You know, pollinators are just like surrogate sexual organs. They are taking the gametes from one individual and moving them to another individual. So they're, you know, the, uh, they're the winged way to, to, you know, have reproduction happen. And um, so that's a, a rather profligate way, and you're spreading your gametes all over the place, and it's expensive. And so many plants try to narrow that down, and they try to get a specificity between the pollinate, you know, between the, their flowers or their individuals. And one way you can do that is to have a subset of pollinators. Rather than all, all bees or all moths, uh, you could maybe hide your nectar in deep spurs, or uh, with, you'd need a very long tongue in order to service some flowers. That gets fidelity into that gamete transfer. So that, that's happening all over the world. And we have some very, very specialized pollinators 
among bees, but uh, LEPs are even more specialized in many cases, and we'll talk about some of those examples. Um, oftentimes, uh, for a, a moth pollinated flower, this nectar is only going to be produced at night. So you can tell right away if you, if, if you know or measure when the nectar is being produced, you'll find out uh, if something is, in fact, um, a moth plant. And um, in, in terms of their importance, um, there are many plants, contrary to the butterflies, that are absolutely reliant on moths. And uh, this is especially true in uh, some tropical ecosystems, in part because in the tropics, nothing's common. So like you, you, you know, in Washington, D.C. or New England or Minnesota, where we talked about, or Iowa, where we talked about, you can walk, go on a walk, uh, a, a two-mile walk, and you're going to see the same species over and over again. And you can go in the tropics and, and walk that, uh, two or three miles, and you're going to see very few organisms over and over again. So you need smart pollinators that, that know how to find something 100 meters away in, uh, a, you know, under a canopy or something like that. So uh, the other thing that uh, moths, pollinators often have are long tongues. So the longest insect tongue on the planet uh, is a 12-incher um, by uh, the common orchid, um, Darwin's orchid in Madagascar. In terms of the plants that are pollinated by moths, um, many orchids, uh, if you ever smell a very sweet smell in a, you know, in a city situation, it's often uh, telia, and that's uh, a, a moth-pollinated plant. So again, getting back to these fragrances. Uh, but there's other things, well, uh, you know, evening primroses, right? They, they open in the evening, so those are moth-pollinated. And, and four o'clock, well, they, they're not opening up till four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's because they like moths. Um, so th this is just that, a reminder that the sphingids are really important in tropical forests. So these are the, our big, strong, smart insects that can uh, work their way through a, a jungle or forest and remember uh, where individuals of one species are. Um, this is just a reminder uh, that um, uh, some, some flowers, uh, Solanaceae, uh, Bombacaceae, and others hide their, uh, their nectar uh, deep in corollas. There's a lot that do this. And then there's these very special systems. I won't talk about it very much. I'm, I'm actually supposed to be talking about conservation, uh, but I'm not. Um, so, um, but they're, they're very, very special associations, yuccas and yucca moths. We can't have one without the other. They, they, they go together. If one goes extinct, the other one does. But we have, we're finding more and more of these. These are what we call uh, nursery systems because uh, the females are uh, ovipositing and putting eggs into the seeds, but uh, female moths are also uh, being very uh, um, deliberate about uh, putting pollen onto the right places of the, of the flower and the right species of pollen. So um, then there's a, a huge system that you won't hear much about, but it's uh, the Selenies. Um, uh, um, enormous radiation of, of one genus and, and uh, one genus of plants and one genus of moths. And it's probably that very tight association that's driving this tremendous radiation of over 700 species. Now, I mentioned something about fragments. I'm just going to read you some text from my book because I think um, I love this. Uh, most, uh, most moth pollinated flowers bloom at night, are predictably white flowered, upregulate their nectar production in late afternoon and early evening, and present their anthers so as to favor cross pollination after nightfall. Nearly all characteristically produce sweet scents. Indeed, some of the most pleasant fragrances on our planet are moth scents that have come into play in human courtship and are, are a way of life in no small way. The wondrous aromas of carnations, gardenias, honeysuckle, lilacs, narcissus, and the queen of all jasmine, which perennially sees use in our perfumes, cosmetics, bouquets, corsages, are first and foremost volatile moth attractors, manufactured by plants to encourage pollen transfer and ensure the completion of their courtships. So anyway, um, if it weren't for my moths and these flowers, some of your dates wouldn't smell quite as good. So. So if, if I'm supposed to talk about uh, conservation, uh, it, it makes sense. Um, it, we, we know there's insect decline and uh, many, many different stressors uh, acting on insects. Uh, one, one thing that I will point out that uh, maybe five of these uh, 12 major stressors that are uh, affecting it, my moths, uh, butterflies, as well as bees, are related to climate change up here at the top. Uh, top droughts, global warming, storm intensity, fire, and uh, the interactions of these, these animals in their ecosystems. 
At this point, based on my understanding of insect decline, the major threats are really habitat degradation, uh, degradation habitat loss. Um, and with this, uh, agricultural intensification is often being pulled out now. It, it's the scale of agriculture and the amount of chemicals that are being used that is making this a special, a special type of habitat destruction. And in many cases, uh, much of the habitat destruction is happening to feed the planet, um, understandably. Um, but this is still probably the major uh, cause of insect imperilment across the planet, particularly in the tropics. But climate change is uh, sweeping past, perhaps in importance, um, of even the land degradation and this tremendous rate of rainforest loss at this point in time on the planet. And it's especially probably true in uh, certain ecosystems. Uh, ones I'm very, very worried about are ecosystems that are driven by moisture. So the cloud forests that we heard about in Hawaii, uh, a tropical rainforest uh, where we have uh, drying out, such as I've probably heard a lot about uh, Monteverde, uh, the clouds are being driven off the top of volcanoes and um, aridifying uh, these forests. And I'm particularly interested in droughts in the American uh, Southwest at this point in time, um, where those caterpillars were from that I just showed you. Nitrification is something you don't hear about a lot, but uh, the burning of fossil fuels releases a tremendous amount of nitrate and nitrite that's fertilizing the entire planet. So every oligotrophic ecosystem on the planet is now under threat from being fertilized. It's not just the Haber-Bosch process and making more nitri nitrogen for fertilizers, but we're actually fertilizing the entire planet. And then I think all these other things are really different. So these are driving losses across wildlands, across the entire West. Um, pesticides are local for the most part. Light pollution is local. Um, introduced species become very problematic. Uh, we've talked about pathogens already today that are introduced. Um, you know, um, uh, they're very serious on islands. Uh, but, but, but far and away, these are the things. And I guess before I, I might forget to say this, and I don't want to, all of it's important. All, that, in, all the death by a thousand cuts is important. But don't take your eyes off the big drivers. So uh, if pesticides is your thing, do it, but know that it's actually climate change that we have to, all of us have to take uh, some role in, in, in slowing down. So endangered species, um, there, there's about 95 uh, insects in, that are listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. As you would expect, most are um, Lepidoptera, and uh, again, all but two of those are our butterflies. So that's where our attention is, but we can use what we've learned from butterflies. So butterflies is where, is where insect conservation got started. And, and so the, you know, the, many of the lessons that we know about how to re restore and, and protect insects come from butterflies. It just makes sense. So we've been studying them forever, you know, two or 300 years and, and lots of historical data. So what do you do to protect insects? Well, it's pretty clear, uh, you know, from my time in, in insect conservation is basically you protect habitat. And so the mantra is just habitat, habitat, and habitat, and, and in many cases, you're gonna have to manage that habitat. So that's what it's about, 90% um, of the time. And uh, I, I think this actually harkens back to um, you know, a lot of what we've already heard today, which is kind of nice, uh, but, but certainly um, uh, uh, dovetails nicely with Matt's talk. Um, but this is just restoration, and it's, it's just amazing and, how, and, and wonderful that you can do habitat reconstruction or restoration on very small levels with insects and have tremendous successes. So you've, at least it's a different picture of a corner blue. It's not the, yeah, it's not the same um, that was shown earlier, but uh, Bruce, Bruce had Carnot Blue in his talk, but there's been some amazing successes. So he talked about how climate change had uh, perhaps driven uh, one population to extirpation in Indiana. Um, I can tell you that um, just a phenomenal numbers of Carnot Blue with habitat restoration in the Albany pine bush were seen over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, populations in the uh, order of, uh, of 50 to 60,000 butterflies were estimated. Um, uh, and it was with fire and, and restoring uh, the, these habitats. Uh, this is a new story that you haven't heard yet. It's just coming out, just being published. And it, it, but again, it, uh, it, it folds in very nicely with what Matt said. Uh, this is a, and, and, and actually what Bruce said as well, because he, I, I, or maybe it was Kevin had the buffalo. 
So this is a buffalo preserve in, I, I believe, Indiana. And uh, th so they're, they're a major landscape, a keystone species or a landscape engineer. And uh, this is surrounded by uh, soybean and corn, lots of pesticides in this, uh, this system. But the butterfly has responded enormously well over the last 10 years. And so this thing, the regal fritillary was going extinct from about every eastern state except for one little colony in, in Pennsylvania, globally declining across almost its entire range. But you can turn things back around with habitat restoration. And um, really good numbers and a feel-good story uh, for, the, for what, this spectacular animal. You can do landscape engineering and uh, habitat restoration on a small scale with, with uh, butterfly, uh, you know, butterfly gardens and pollinator gardens, right? So uh, they're great for, uh, for, for everybody. They're great for adults and kids. Uh, uh, great for adult butterflies, I should say, uh, dispersing and, and migrating. Um, very important after dark. So, you know, in, in forested ecosystems, there's a tremendous amount of Lepidoptera flying around. And again, you can't see it uh, because you're asleep. But uh, there is not, there's a real shortage of nectar in forested ecosystems, right? And so uh, you could provide, you know, fuel stations in your yard. Uh, you're not doing this uh, necessarily. Um, well, I don't know why you're doing it. You might be doing it for the butterflies, but I can tell you that a lot of moths will make a lot of caterpillars for birds. So you're not just helping the insects when you're, you're uh, producing a pollinator garden, particularly near a forest. We, we build these uh, for education. Uh, there's more and more data coming out that these gardens uh, and getting outside, turning soil, sun are helping with both mental and physical wellness. Um, but. One of the things we don't do very well, I think, right now is uh, consider what the larval host plants are for, for moths. So a lot of people, a lot of talk about planting monarch uh, a food plant, milkweeds. Milkweeds are great for milkweed butterflies, uh, but you know there might be two dozen species for the entire genus of, of uh, caterpillars across all of North America. Uh, oak by, by um, Nine, 900 different species so far. Uh, so it, it really matters what you plant in your yard. Uh, but if you like birds, you might want to plant some oak. Um, and it's, it's amazing. I think only 10 genera of, of trees support like 60% of Eastern North American species of Lepidop Lepidoptera. So you can, you can get a lot of traction with the right plants. And Doug Tallamy has certainly uh, told us a lot about that. Um, I don't know how long I've been talking. Do you? <laughs> I haven't given this talk before. Uh, so I, I, I'll kind of, I, I have no idea where I am. But anyway, uh, one thing that we're finding out is that light pollution is actually probably a bigger driver of insect decline than we had thought five years ago. And there's uh, quite a bit of data coming. I know I, I cut down some forest to build my house. Uh, and. The light collecting was fabulous that first year, and I thought I'd bought just the right property. And then it was really good the second year. And by the third year, I said, you know, I'm starting to believe that lights, I was running lights every night, and, uh, and I, you know, I'd go out in the yard, and I'd saw, I saw the bats uh, right, right above my light. They, you know, within two days, the bats learned to, to forage at your house lights that you leave on all night. And then anything that's left in the morning, the birds get. Um, and that doesn't count anything that ran along the ground eating anything on the ground over the course of the night. So I, I think lights are really a sink for, for moths. And ultimately what you're doing is you're getting rid of bird food. And there's now, again, in this last year, more data saying that actually food limitation for birds is part of the decline of North American birds. It's not... It's not terribly strong, but we're getting more and more evidence. And, and another thing, might as well, since you don't know how long I've been talking, um, is, is that our aerial insectivores are declining about as fast as any group of birds. So swallows, uh, chimney swifts, and uh, other birds that feed on insects on the wing are really declining uh, quite rapidly in places. And, and that looks like it's a pretty strong insect link. So um, another great thing about that pollinator garden, and I, I don't know who mentioned if it was um, 
Bruce, who mentioned iNaturalist or not. So if I, if, if I get that wrong, I'm sorry. But I, everybody knows iNaturalist is, is really important now. Uh, we're getting b big data. Uh, so we're, we're learning how to analyze that data. This community data is phenomenal for insects. Insects have become one of the, uh, the, the poster childs for iNaturalist. Uh, Kenichi Ueda, the guy that created uh, iNaturalist, spends his time photographing insects. But um, pollinator gardens allow you to uh, do and learn uh, iNaturalist just in your backyard. But it's, it's pretty phenomenal at this point in time. I think they over of almost 400,000 species have been uh, documented in iNaturalist. And uh, a lot of that, uh, the, the growth of insect uh, records is uh, like a hockey stick going, going straight up at this point in time. So actually, that's going to be a part of insect conservation going forward. We can use that data to, to, to understand the drivers of faunal change, um, uh, understand the role of climate change, understand, for example, there was a huge study on butterflies declining in, uh, in, in North America. It was published in Science in January of last year, and the single greatest drivers of butterfly decline in Western North America on our continent were not surprisingly agriculture. That was expected. It, uh, and it wasn't urbanization in, in residences. It was actually uh, drying, and particularly the, the prolongation of summer and the hotter temperatures in late summer. Uh, the, the, this drying out and the desiccation of, of the American West is serious and, and driving declines of about 1.5% a year of the butterfly fauna across two or 300 species. Um, so just to remind you again that this, this, this climate change I think is now exceeding habitat degradation. Um, this is something that's really, really important to me. This is just uh, the world's warming up obviously. Um, last, uh, in October 2021, 92% uh, of the American West was in drought um, the worst drought, um, Bruce mentioned this, so worst drought in 1,200, there have been five major droughts through time uh, since we have tree ring data going back to 800. So a drought here, a drought here. This was a really, oops, looks like my battery just went. The one in the late 1500s was the worst, and um, the most recent one now has now been deemed the worst drought in 12,000 years. This is driving species to extinction now. Uh, and bees uh, would be very much imperiled. The, the, one of the meccas for bees in the world is the American Southwest. So I'll get off the stage shortly. And so these, these are some of the things you can do. I think we really need to change the, cult we need to change the culture of uh, how people feel about insects. <laughs> there are people in the United States who will spray their house with pesticides uh, for one house fly or one ant or some non-pest inside. The culture is completely um, so different from Asia, and where you know insects are in song, that you can buy them uh, as pets in, in stores. Uh, there's insect nets in hardware stores, and very, very different ethic. We have to change the culture and societal attitudes. Um, I think uh, community science is great. Uh, I know within Moz alone, there's 14,000 people now on a Caterpillar uh, Facebook group, Caterpillar Identification, so that's becoming really it's becoming an avocation or a hobby for many more people. You know, po pollinator gardens are, are great. Rewild parts of your yard. If you took 10% of your yard in the United States and rewild it, it'd be more than all the land in all the national parks. Um, plant, plant natives, of course. Uh, and we, we need to find more things like strips to make agriculture more friendly. Um, everything you can do to slow climate change and lower your carbon footprint and nothing works as well as policy. Um, and um, we can all do our things individually, but it's really not, go I gotta get off the stage. But uh, it's, not an, it's not enough, I, the change it, we, we're all out of time and things are declining very rapidly, so we, we, we do everything you can to change policy.